This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen and Paul Sweeney. Why are we upset if we're creating jobs? Inflation is still a thing out there for the everyday consumer. With Lisa Mateo on markets. The economic calendar jam-packed today. And Michael Barr with news. Tensions between the U.S. and China have heated up even more. The best in economics, finance, investment, and international relations. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on Bloomberg Radio. Good morning, everyone. The master's on, which means Damien Zassar has to be here. Yeah, we'll talk golf this morning. I think Jamie Dimon goes 18 holes this weekend. Yeah, I do, actually. Uh, well, actually, no, he's probably going to be in the tent uh, enjoying all the lobster and crab, ca- crab down at Augusta. The pimento. The, the pimento, pimento yeah, sandwiches. Exactly. It's bank earnings time. Wells Fargo out, J.P. Morgan out. I'll talk to Damien about J.P. Morgan. It's a startup firm. They're doing okay for the last uh, 90 days. Lots going on in the list of guests this morning is the best look ahead I've ever seen on this uh, project. The team has just done a fabulous job to stagger through April and into May. David Blanchflower of Dartmouth College will join us. I requested Terrence Haynes of Pangea on Iran and all the emotion in the Levant. Michael Purvis on the equity markets. Calvin Say, Leland Miller on China. We're going to talk to Damien about Yen Week and all that. A conversation with Susan Collins of the Boston Fed in a real special treat. Chris Whalen stopped by after the banking earnings to talk about some of the risks on the balance sheet. I want to make a special program note. Good morning, Boston. A legend with us today. Chuck Clough is iconic at Merrill Lynch. He invented what strategists do. We are honored that Chuck Clough uh, will darken the surveillance door uh, this morning. We're out on Apple CarPlay. We're on YouTube. What a week for our YouTube celebration. Got all sorts of other digital stuff. We're trying to get into the digital age, just like Jamie Dimon (laughs) and and Brian Moynihan, of course, the Interactive Broker Studios. Damien, 30 seconds. I think J.P. Morgan's sandbagging it. They don't want people to know what they're making off of 2019. Stashing for a later day. Now, I don't disagree with that. I mean, things are looking a little bit bleak here, though. I mean, we got J.P. Morgan shares down 4% in the pre-market, and I think it's dragging down Wells, it's dragging down City. I mean, we're going to talk to Allison Williams. She's going to tell us what net interest margins mean to some of the big banks. With our Bloomberg Business Flash, Lisa Mateo. Good morning. And equity futures taking a turn after big bank earnings starting to trickle in. We have the NASDAQ right now. NASDAQ futures down about half a percent. S&P futures down four tenths of a percent. We have Dow futures down three tenths of a percent. So I want to start there. We'll start with J.P. Morgan Chase down nearly four percent right now. We're reported adjusted revenue for the first quarter beat estimates. And that was the same news over at Wells Fargo. Those shares, they're down about 2% right now. Then we have BlackRock, they're up 2%. Long-term investment funds, they took in $76 billion of net inflow is in the first quarter, pushing it to a record $10.5 trillion of client assets. Now, we're also waiting results, State Street and Citigroup. We will keep you posted right here. We'll head over to the bond market. The two-year yield at 4.92%. That's down about four basis points. The 10-year yield at 4.53%, and that's down about five basis point. To commodities, gold hit another record. We have spot uh, Comex gold at 2,414 an ounce, but spot gold at 2,397 an ounce. And then we have uh, commodities like silver hit the highest in more than three years. Copper rose to its highest level since June 2022. Yes. All right. That is your Bloomberg Business Flash. Tom and Paul. Lisa Mateo, thanks so much. Damien. Damien's got like four inches of notes. Sweeney and I, we just show up. Yeah, you know, we have a coffee. Up. I like to prepare. In the water. Sassar is going to jump in with some smart Bloomberg intelligence stuff with his colleague, Allison Williams. Allison, the six and a new one from James Diamond in his annual letter. We must be a source of strength. I'm sorry, they're sandbagging it. I look at some of the numbers, 2019, and the growth of this juggernaut out to expected 2024. I know, there's this, it's all 4% in that. Is this the most profitable institution on the planet? It's, it's definitely the most profitable and large banking world. Um, and I'll say two things. So first, on the annual letter, you know, it's interesting you make the point that they added this this new uh, sort of important principle, but they're kind of acknowledging what's already been there. Right. So they talked about being a source of strength. Um, you know, they, they were a source of strength uh, in the bank turmoil, I will call it. They were a source of strength in the pandemic, which was yeah. more of a crisis. <clears throat> they were a source of strength in the global crisis, acknowledging what's happening. So, it's terrible. 
Let's turn <laughs> Damien, Damien, assets. Well, you know, I mean. No, wait, wait, Mary Erdos, assets up 19%. Damien, <laughs> hold my hand, Damien, please. I, on YouTube, Sasser and I are holding hands and it's not over Purdue's loss. Return on equity, I mean, 17%. Return on tangible, 21%. It's terrible. All my buddies at JP Morgan, all the MDs over there, I mean, they're just looking. I mean, they, you know, remember, they have a window where they can't sell their shares, right? So they're looking for actually JP Morgan to maybe hide it up a little bit because, you know, they want they want the share price to go up to 200 so quickly, right? I mean, they're going to get stopped out. They, they want a nice, slow upward grind. Ask Allison right, Allison. a smart question. And, and you know, the disappointment today may be that they're keeping the headline net interest income yeah. outlook stable. But look underneath the surface. Thank you. Number one, the core net interest income guidance is up. That's what we care about, the core. Because the the overall number includes some trading net interest income. It's a wash with fees. It doesn't matter. It's coming out of the, it's coming out of another bucket. So let's, you know, focus on uh, the drivers. Thank you. And I think that investors Everybody can see that we, you know, had expected six or seven hikes yep. last time. Now it's three. So I think, you know, maybe there was a little bit more hype about about a change in this interest, net interest income outlook. But look, we're we're early in the quarter. These are risk managers. They're also managing expectations. Wells Fargo has been very conservative in their management of expectations. J.P. Morgan the same, right? Like they beat and raised on net interest income guidance all last year. Yeah. You know, this quarter the banks are coming in in line Allison, with the guidance. Allison, when you and I studied this, and let's be sure, let's make it clear, folks. Allison Pro, Tom Amateur, <laughs> someone with a 21% ROTC. Are I you mean, kidding me? In banking land, I we mean, didn't read about that. This, Damien, jump in. No, I mean, Allison, please, we're cutting you off. But I mean, I, look, I know it's not JP Morgan. JP Morgan <clears throat> provisioning doesn't even matter to JP Morgan, right? I mean, forget about it. But what, I mean, uh, look, credit card delinquencies are going up. They you know, are. Talk to us about in which, is it Wells? Is it City? Where should we be looking for, for provisioning, for NPLs, that sort of thing? What we should be looking at is these provisions coming in much lower than we thought, Interesting. despite everything you just said, right? So the card business, that's on fire at these banks. Card loan growth is a standout. You're going to hear from all these regional banks. You're going to see squishy loans. You right. know, you see JP Morgan and Citi benefiting from this card growth. They are seeing provisions, but look, home lending, residential home that's lending, right. a reserve release. And this can only Explain be... Explain that to mere mortals. Explain what that is. That means we thought losses were going to be super bad, but now we look at what's happening with home prices, we look at what's happening with delinquencies, and you know what? It's just not that bad. They're moving money back onto the accounting statements. There's, there's, they're they're less, saying things yeah. are not as bad okay. as we Damien, thought. Damien, ask a smart question. Trading and banking, any re takeaway from that? Trading and banking, I mean, the surprising to the upside at J.P. Morgan, Always. they are the leader in Always. this business. It's Better terrible. on FIC. It's uh, uh, better on equities trading. I, I, Allison, I'm sorry. I think it's the biggest bunch. You're, you're phenomenal at this, and you're, you're really good to go. Tom's turning purple. The headline. I'm turning purple, folks, because with all great collegiality to my good friend James Diamond, they're sandbagging. They don't want the regulators. They don't want Senator Warren of the, of the Commonwealth of Boston to know how much they're making. I looked down Park Avenue yesterday at their beautiful building. They're starting to put the skin on it. Yeah. They're spending three billion plus, this according to Reuters, on 270 Park Avenue. That's completely the opposite of work from home, isn't it? It is, and we know that Jamie Dimon has been one of the most vocal people about bringing back to work bringing people back to work and having people uh, back in the office. A lot of people in their you know, core headquarters, they were back in May of 2020, uh, five days a week. So uh, putting yeah. us all to shame. And you know what? I, I will say the biggest thing right. about JP Morgan, right. they, you got to spend money to make money. Investors have he does, really- He said that in not his annual his letter. <laughs> Damien, get one more question. One more question here. Big versus thing. small banks. You know, I know the value trade is, is not really there in this market. It's all Magnificent Seven. But, you know, if you are going to allocate to the banking sector, where do you want to put your money here? So, you know, we don't make recommendations. Course, but sorry, I can't talk fundamentals, you, right? You? I can talk fundamentals. And, and again, the big banks, card, that's benefiting the biggest yes. banks. It is not benefiting the smaller banks. Okay. The smaller you go, the more pressure you have from commercial real estate. Yeah. That's a long drawn out story. Right. And so we think that the fundamentals are really uh, definitely for the, for this quarter and the outlook. You guys, your date calendar's mental. Please, I'm begging, can I get Allison Williams and Gina Martin Adams together in the studio 
in the coming 10 or 15 days. Sure. If your calendars align. Sure. Gina was. Just, just come on down to uh, the fourth floor. Well, oh, we'll no, chat, we'll we could do a remote yeah, down there. Come down to four. Think of the food opportunities. <laughs> Allison Williams, thank you so we'll much there the on pantry. the banks. I hope, folks, that was a better conversation to learn about these ginormous entities rather than this ratio. Or <laughs> that. Rich, where's J.P. Morgan right now? Help me. Down 4%. Down 4%. Thank you, Rich uh, Truman. For, Rich is not the same. The Rangers lost last night. He's not on his game. Always on his game with our news in New York City, Michael Barr. Tom, Damian, Lisa, thank you very much. The U.S. spy community is waiting to hear if Congress will renew a portion of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. The House may vote later today on renewing 702, the section in FISA. U.S. intelligence officials call 702 crucial to doing their jobs because it gives them the power to collect communications of non-Americans located outside the country without a warrant. FBI Director Christopher Wray pleaded with a congressional panel to end the stalemate in the Appropriations Committee and allow it to reach the House floor on a vote. It helps us find out who these terrorists are working with and what they're targeting, and we made and it's what we need to stop them before they kill Americans. Critics say the surveillance program is a violation of civil liberties, and Americans who might get caught up in the spy scheme deserve privacy. This week, 19 Republicans vote with their party, uh, broke with their party to prevent the bill from coming up for a vote. The measure expires a week from today. Vice President Kamala Harris is traveling to Arizona today. It comes after the battleground state Supreme Court ruling putting a strict abortion ban from 1864 into effect. The Biden-Harris campaign has launched a multi-million dollar ad campaign in Arizona. Democratic Governor Katie Hobbs. I'm ready to do whatever it takes to get the 1864 ban repealed. Earlier this week, Democrats in the state's legislature planning to repeal the law were shut down by Republicans. The Arizona House Speaker says Democrats are eager to enshrine in our state constitution a right to kill unborn children. President Joe Biden has added more Chinese companies and individuals to an export block list than any U.S. administration. The Commerce Department added six Chinese companies to its entity list yesterday, bringing the tally of new targets during the Biden administration to 319. After round one at the Masters, Bryson DeChambeau leads at 7-under. Tiger Woods is 1-under after 13 before play was suspended. Global News 24 hours a day and whenever you want it with the Bloomberg News Now. I'm Michael Barr. This is Bloomberg. Tom, Damian. Lisa. Michael Barr, thanks so much. I haven't even had time yet to get out on live chat on YouTube. I'll do that here in a moment. Damian says, I want to go to two things. Felice Morans writes it up for Bloomberg News. And to be serious here, stock down 4%. Disappointing results from J.P. Morgan. Missing on loans, expenses, including including $725 million for parking fees, I guess, over in Park Avenue. I don't know. Whatever. I get it. D D Damien, the scale here, and I go back to when you were at Lehman, yes. is 309,000 employees, the operating margin, there I am, yeah. from pandemic 39%, pre-pandemic, out to 43%. The margin expansion alone is an act of God. Yeah, no, I, I guess I guess you're right there. I'm, I'm, I think uh, you know, I think J.P. Morgan's a, he sh they are the king of the road, man. I mean, they, as as go they, so go the U.S. economy. One ninety five on J.P. Morgan to close right now. Let's round it up. One eighty nine on YouTube. Search Bloomberg podcast. I'll get out on live chat on a break. Stay with us worldwide. Bloomberg surveillance from Jamie Diamonds in New York City.
markets, headlines, and breaking news 24 hours a day on Bloomberg Radio, Bloomberg Television, and the Bloomberg Business App. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. From the Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio, I'm Lisa Mateo. Futures taking a hit, and this is following gains from yesterday when the NASDAQ actually hit a record. Came after U.S. producer prices in March increased less than forecast, and that followed consumer price growth that exceeded forecast. Now, that latest economic data changing the views on interest rates. Economist Deutsche Bank, Bank of America say the Fed will ease policy just once this year. In December, the Fed's Susan Collins said there could be fewer cuts this year. So now we have NASDAQ futures down half a percent, S&P futures down four tenths of a percent, Dow futures down three tenths of a percent. Over to the two-year yield at 4.91 percent, that's down about five basis points. The 10-year yield at 4.52 percent, and that's down about six basis points. To currencies, want to point out the pound drops below 125. It's the lowest since November, the euro dropped to the weakest level against the dollar in five months. Bank earnings, they were trickling in. I want to point out JP Morgan Chase down nearly 4%. Wells Fargo down about three tenths of a percent. BlackRock is up 2%. We're also waiting results from State Street and Citigroup. Um, and since we're talking banks, one check in Morgan Stanley. We had that report that U.S. regulators scrutinizing the firm's efforts to prevent potential money, money laundering by those wealthy clients. We'll have an update on that. That is your Bloomberg Business Flash. Tom and Damien. Yeah, thanks so much, Elisa. Greatly appreciate it. Damien Sessar in for Paul Sweeney uh, this morning. Bank earnings out. We'll continue to focus on this juggernaut, J.P. Morgan, down 4%. percent That underwriting. Right. Yeah, right. Bad Huge underwriting. beat. Huge beat. Huge, I mean, bond well, issuance. Translate that for people. Well, I mean, look, we're looking for fixed income primary market activity to be, you know, relatively tight here, but we're just not seeing it. Financial conditions are loose. It doesn't matter that the Fed's not going to ease in June. They got Tom. a better nominal GDP yeah. to work in. I get, like, Felice has this great article. There's this problem. There's that problem. <laughs> Where are they in three years? Yeah. In three I'm, years? I'm I don't asking. know. Where were the 10 largest S&P constituents three years ago? I can tell you this. If yeah. you add it up, their market cap is the size of China. This is a joy. We're going to get this out of the way right now. It's a seasonal tradition here. We go to David Blanche Flower. He is in Hanover, New Hampshire, or he's in Florida, or he's in where he's traveling <laughs> in Wales, or that. <laughs> David, Danny Blanche Flower, describe, as we get to the job economy, describe the black fly season in hanover new hampshire it's like worst <laughs> on the planet isn't it it is we uh we're now in uh, mud season and we've had uh frozen ground for a very long time um, i came back here from florida we've had two snowstorms since and then what happens eventually is the frozen stuff in the ground eventually right. melts and uh water flows down and the black flies appear right. So this is this is not the greatest month to be in Hanover, New Hampshire, yeah. but it's great to be with the students, and it's been great. And when it stops snowing, it's been right. raining every day. So it makes you yearn for Florida and yearn for New York City, but, you know, you do what you do. Right. <laughs> David, I, I want to go back to the wage curve and your iconic right. study of the agony, the pain of wage dynamics in the labor economy. The biggest single debate that I get in mail is people with bow ties saying the economy's pretty good, and thousands of people are telling me, Tom, you don't know what you're talking about in three zip codes in Manhattan. The labor economy's really weak. Professor Blanchflower, which is it? Well, obviously there's, there's kind of two worlds, but I think the story actually, if you go back to the wage curve and subsequent stuff, the unemployment rate actually no longer tells you much of anything about the economy. Just to put it technically, it's unrelated to wages. So I think people give you the wrong steer from that. The right thing to look at is, is basically employment. And the US has a really big puzzle, unlike every other country in the world, in the employment rate in the US today is below what it was in 2008 and below what it was in 2000. So that's an element of weakness. The other thing to say, in, in basic to back the conversation that you just had, if you look at what's happened on the employment on the household account, the decline in jobs in the last eight months or so is greater than it was in, in the months from, from February 2008 through 2007. So there's conflicting evidence. Some people are really feeling weakness. Other people are seeing strength. And I was just looking to think about that question, Tom. Obviously, you, you look at the non-farm payrolls and it looks really good. And, and obviously, the co economy has been pretty resilient. 
But I was just looking at in front of me at the, the Conference Board Consumer Confidence Surveys. The expectations index, which basically predicts recession, is essentially saying we're in recession, have been in recession for quite a long time. <laughs> so there's this conflict, and obviously part of it is a political conflict. Republicans say the economy is doing pretty badly, and the Democrats say it's doing pretty well. So it's a really pretty confusing picture. Uh, I think the answer is the economy has been more resilient, but we've had to put up with, with an inflation shock. So it's a kind of poised answer. But I think, uh, and I have a new paper that people can go and see in Economica, where Phillips published his original paper, showing you that there's much more weakness here than you would have thought for the strength of the economy. Professor Blanchard, are casting shade on the household survey, Tom. I mean, it's clear he's an establishment survey kind of guy, but no, he's, in all seriousness. He's cruel and unusual. <laughs> cruel. The big question well, facing markets, uh, Professor Blanchard, for me anyway, isn't, you know, whether the Fed will cut rates, but why. Talk to us a little bit about whether or not you feel below target inflation is enough of a case for the Fed to justify rate cuts this year. Well, it's probably not enough. I mean, the analogy I always like to give is go back to think where you were in, say, April, May, June, July 2008. And the discussion was much like this one, saying, you know, our rate, the cut's coming, inflation is 5%, you know, it's going to be 8% in the future. Well, that story was clearly wrong. Um, uh, so, so the answer is, well, what is, what is the Fed going to do? I mean, I think the answer is we're waiting for some data. I mean, I think the really important data is spent, despite the com consumer confidence there I've just talked about, people have continued to spend on services. They continue to go to the Broadway shows. The question is, is there anything that's going to prevent that? Uh, the, the other thing I would say, um, Damien and to Tom, and, is that it always strikes me as kind of funny. I mean, I always thought when you set interest rates, your job was to think about what inflation was going to yeah. be in 18 months' time. So what, what the inflation print was this month or next month or the month after was only relevant if it was a surprise. So I just find it really hard to understand for someone who set interest rates 36 times, why people think that a single data point is going to impact what the Fed does. The Fed should be thinking about what inflation is going to be in 18 months. And as far as I can tell, all the indicators are that it's going to be well below the target which actually says you should be doing rate cuts. So that's the really big debate. Why does the Fed think that a, a, a inflation print next month is going to severely change their view about right. what interest rates right. will be in 18 months? I mean, the reason being that it takes 18 right. months for anything for you to do to have an impact. So I find this discussion wholly disheartening. And, and in a well, sense, it's like, well, well, why do they think changing interest rates will affect inflation in a week's time? It doesn't make any sense Dan, to me. Dan, we got to go. Don't be a stranger. Thank you so much there. But I really Good. wanted to get Professor Blanchard around with this huge response to Tom. You don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> The job economies out there. I mean, Damien, we're going to do lots of technical stuff today. Dive into JP. We'll put our options hats Look on, at the sure. SASR world. What Yen's doing and EM and you know, like copper up to a record copper. high just gets my attention. Copper eight point eight percent year to date. But there's there's no other issue that I get mail on, Damien, from people out on YouTube on Apple CarPlay then, Tom, you guys are nuts. The job economy is terrible. So you go to the leading guy. It must, fe it must feel that way. I mean, and look, that's why I look at the household survey, right? Because that shows you what the size of the labor force is. So I think your average household there probably is feeling like unemployment is rising, right? Because despite a bigger labor force, you know, there are just more unemployed people. There's that migrant issue we've talked about in the past. But truthfully, yeah. payrolls have been blow out 300,000 plus, and it looks like there's yeah. no end to it. I failed there. I, I didn't have time to talk to Professor Blanche Flower about mill. Wall. Cardiff City's <laughs> visiting Millwall this weekend. Oh, is that right? In the Champions League. Yeah, Pharaoh taught me this oh, stuff. Okay. I have no idea what I'm talking <laughs> about. Yen. What's the level for you on dollar yen where the institutions of Japan panic? They got to wait until well, we their fearless leader gets home. We knew we were going to cut through 152, and now it's just a matter of when, not if, they the BOJ get, they gets get, in and starts defending Did you go to the currency. state dinner? Uh, no, I missed it. You know, next week is IMF week, so you know I was invited to a few steak dinners down in Washington. Are you, are you going? No, I have to work. Yeah, you know, yeah. It's tough, I'm not, tough I'm not stuff. going this year either. I mean, yeah. it's, it's kind of it's. But you know what? There's a lot to you have to get on the Bank of America uh, guest list because they have all the great meetings. According to my people, are all going down there. Yeah. They just got their agendas. They're really yeah. excited. Did you get the El Salvador? Did you get the Ecuador? Which meeting are you in? Which meeting are you in? That's what they're all talking You're about. You're going to get Tom Keen on the Bank of America guest list. I, I I'm not. Moynihan, he, he, <laughs> Brian would just say no. No, lose the bow tie. <laughs>
We have Damien Sassauer. It's a really interesting Friday as we look ahead into the end of April towards that Fed meeting. JP Morgan, out with earnings. Headlines and breaking news 24 hours a day on Bloomberg Radio, Bloomberg Television, and the Bloomberg Business App. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. From the Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio, I'm Lisa Mateo. Futures pointing to a lower open right now. We have NASDAQ futures down about half a percent. S&P futures down three-tenths of a percent. Dow futures down two-tenths of a percent. The two-year yield at 4.91 percent. That's down about five basis points. The 10-year yield at 4.52 percent, and that's down about six basis points. On the economic calendar for today, we have a report on import prices for March. That comes out at 8.30 Wall Street time. We also have a read on sentiment from the University of Michigan. But the big focus on earnings from big banks, we've already heard from some of them, with disappointing results from J.P. Morgan, Wells Fargo. We have J.P. Morgan down three percent wells fargo down about three tenths of a percent blackrock is up about two percent i want to turn to tech now intel down two percent amd down nearly two percent this is after that report from the wall street journal that china telling its telecom carriers to phase out foreign ships by 2027 and then you have samsung sources are saying it's preparing to take the wraps off a 44 billion dollar investment in u.s chip making 
as soon as next week. That is your Bloomberg Business Flash. Tom and Damian. Lisa Mateo, thank you so much. There's always an intelligence and force to the notes and the conversations with Terry Haynes of Pangea Policy. In the last 48 hours, it has changed. There is an urgency and immediacy to what he says of how Washington must look to Tehran and by car through Baghdad, across Iraq, through Jordan, to Tel Aviv, a distance of 1,300 miles. Terry Haynes on this weekend in the Levant. Terry, how grim is it? Well, Tom, it's uh, I think it's grim, but uh, it depends on a word that's being bandied around a lot here and elsewhere, uh, proportionality. What I'm afraid of is that markets tend to think, uh, Westerners tend to think that uh, the Iranian response, either through itself or its proxies, will end up being what uh, an Iranian official told a, a, a German official, that you know, their response would be proportional. Well, proportional to Iran and proportional to us are probably two different things. So uh, I think that, uh, as mm -hmm. we've talked before, there's a lack of appreciation for uh, just how big the potential geopolitical shocks right. can be here. Are the political shocks Iran and Iraq 20, 30 years ago in that horrific war that they fought, almost, you know, Karakar is, is a, media, a medieval war, or is this about guerrilla efforts, localized efforts by Iran to uh, retaliate? Uh, well, it's probably both. Uh, you know, there's a uh, there's a very wide range of uh, potential options, uh, at least ten to twelve, uh, from what I can count, and uh, and you know they they could happen individually or in some combination. But uh, my, my my concern is from a market's perspective, is that you know markets haven't had to assess anything like this really uh, for a couple of decades, and there aren't uh, aren't many people who have been around and can assess those things. Uh, so I tend to think that there might be a disproportionate market reaction if there's anything but the usual tit for tat in the Middle East, and I don't think that's what we're looking at here. Terry, you mentioned those dozen or so options, and I think about them. You know, uh, you know, foreign embassies. You know, is it Iran going to go direct? Are they going to go through mm -hmm. Hezbollah or the Houthis? But you know, talk right. to us a little bit about you know what the most likely outcome, in your view, is. Um, well, I, I'm not going to be able to put myself completely in the uh, the minds of the Iranian government, Damien. But uh, you know, I tend to think that there might be a, uh, uh, a you know embassy attacks that there might well be. Uh, or a stepped up activity uh, both from Hamas and uh, and and kind of from the Lebanon Syria uh, frontier. Uh, I do not think that there's likely to be a direct attack on uh, on Israel only because uh, that would violate kind of the informal uh, arrangements that to, that are known over there as the envelope, the uh, the informal kind of. Uh, rules of the game that uh, tend to govern uh, Israel versus non-Israeli uh, combatants. Uh, you know, it's in neither party's interest to completely blow those up. But I do, but I do think there's uh, greater than a trailing risk that something like that might happen. Uh, yeah. At some point, this is going to get uh, uh, irresistible to the Iranians. Terry, let's cut to the chase here. Israel's relationship with the Middle East is in utter disarray. Its relationship with another, uh, a number of other major foreign players, I'm thinking Turkey, Colombia, Brazil, even the UN, continues to deteriorate. At this stage, what, if anything, can Israel do to repair some of these relationships? Well, I think one one of the things that's going to happen is is that they're going to finish their uh, their Gaza operation. Uh, the United States has not proved, or anybody else has proved, to be uh, to, uh, able to broker a different result. Uh, but you know, we're we're going to be, and I don't want to be Pollyannish about this at all. Uh, but there was a, a an existing peace process with the Saudis and others that predated all this, mm -hmm. and uh, that that's going to get picked picked back up. A lot of the delicacy that you see right now in the relationship has to do with the ability to pick that up uh, post-war. And, uh, and yeah. Israel remains very interested in that. And I think that's largely what's going to happen. Terry, one final question. we got to run on to the markets here. Futures folks are negative 18. Terry Haynes, I, I, I'm just, at least Mateo had this in Michael Barr, and I'm not briefed on it. There's going to be a mm -hmm. meeting, a love fest in Mar-a-Lago this afternoon, <laughs> this evening, whatever of President Trump and the Speaker of House of the United States of America, Congress, Mr. Johnson. What's gonna be accomplished? 
uh, what's going to be accomplished is a visual uh, showing that uh, Johnson has Trump's confidence uh, and that uh, that Trump has uh, Johnson's back on the continued speakership. So you're not going to see another disruption uh, like you saw with McCarthy last fall. That will enable the uh, Johnson and the others to, to yeah. finish up uh, the okay. few bits of remaining business that they have. Uh, Terry, thank you so much. Terry Haynes with Pangea there on Iran, and uh, we'll be watching that through the weekend. Ethan Bronner leading our coverage in Tel Aviv. Can't say enough about the Israeli coverage uh, and the Levant coverage we've seen out of Bloomberg at News. What's on my screen? I got equities, bonds, currencies, commodities. Mateo with the data check. She's doing a great job. The VIX 15.39. Oh, look at that. Gold. 2408. Damien, is it just the Chinese buying at the margin? To me, that's what I'm hearing. No, it's not just, it's not it's not just the China. It's not just the PBOC. It's Russia. It's Turkey. It's the Middle East. There's a lot of gold buyers out there. But you're right. There's a lot of official central bank buying, and that's what's propping things up. I, I mean, 2400 I mean, you know, Nixon, $35. <laughs> I haven't done the compound there, but, you know, it's like Apple. I hear Trump's remodeling his uh, living room also, so that may be good. And yeah. a little bit of support to uh, to the yellow metal. Yeah, but the, the yellow metal, 2400 How Do you trade that within EM? I yeah. Mean, copper, I guess. No, yes, you Co do. Yeah, absolutely do. No, you trade gold. Gold is sort of like a surrogate for cash. It's a it's a tool for capital preservation, and it's one that, quite frankly, is getting a lot of attention in the uh, in the circles that I okay, talk to. Okay, so Souk, a souk in Dubai, I get it. They're moving bracelets. Yeah. What does Indonesia, as an example, do with gold? Um, that's a good question. The BOI has its own set of issues. Um, you know, for me, Indonesia is all about, you know, they're trying to build a new capital. They're trying to kind of move from Jakarta. There's a they're lot like of a debt they've issued in order to fund yeah. that project. And, you know, yields are, it's one of the high yielders in Asia. So, you know, up until maybe this last week, I would have been a buyer of, of, of Indonesia. I would have liked to hold IDR, but I don't think you can hold anything but the dollar in this environment, Tom, and we can talk about that. Well, we're going to have to talk about that. We'll find some holes here across three hours of coverage today. To Dr. Damien Sassauer, uh, about that, Damien, I want to then look at one currency pair, which has moved overnight. Mm -hmm. Lagarde was it was beautiful, everything was fine. We are the world. <laughs> Oops, a 108 down to 10657. Six, 57. What is Bloomberg Intelligence or your sources on the street modeling out euro? I'm hearing 105 on the way to parity. So, so for our for our listeners, that's a move of down 1.6 percent on the week. That's a pretty big move in euro dollar, which is arguably the most liquid cross that we track here at mm -hmm. Bloomberg. I mean, look, let's be clear. It's about CNH and, and Euro. I mean, those are the two currencies that matter most if you're a U.S. dollar investor that's looking to go offshore. And my goodness, if you do look at China Yuan here, I mean, the 10-year China U.S. Uh, yield spread, a record low of 225 yeah. basis points. So, I mean, that tells you everything you need to know. These low yielders are having a lot of trouble in this environment where the Fed is expected right. to be on hold for longer. For Global Wall Street, the DXY, the major trading currency through 103.04, 105.84. Can you imagine on this Friday, a 106 DXY? That changes the world of Damien mm -hmm. uh, Sassauer. Uh, right now, the VIX 15.38. Uh, the sell-off has slowed down a little bit off the bank earnings. Wells Fargo, JP Morgan, from a minus 22 to minus 17 on Standard & Poor's futures. With our news in New York City, Michael Barr. Thank you very much, Tom, Damian, Lisa. Today, the House will vote on reauthorizing the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. A yes vote renews FISA for two more years instead of five. It is a win for conservative Republicans who say two years allows Donald Trump, if he wins the presidency, to make his mark on FISA. Yesterday, FBI Director Christopher Wray told lawmakers that the U.S. is facing more threats from foreign adversaries and appealed to Congress to renew it. Bloomberg's Amy Morris has details from Washington. Ray appeared before the House Appropriations Subcommittee hearing on the fiscal year 2025 budget request for the FBI. But he told the panel that failure to reauthorize FISA would be dangerous for the country. As I look back over my career in law enforcement, I would be hard pressed to think of a time where so many threats to our public safety and national security were so elevated all at once. Ray says threats to the U.S. from foreign terrorists have been rising since Hamas attacked Israel on October 7th. In Washington, Amy Morris, Bloomberg Radio. Former President Trump and House Speaker Mike Johnson are set to appear at a joint news conference later today at Mar-a-Lago. The presser about election integrity comes as Johnson is facing pressure from a Trump ally in Congress to be removed as Speaker. Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene threatens to activate a snap vote 
that could remove Johnson. President Biden will forgive $7.4 billion in federal student debt in his latest push to provide relief to borrowers. About 277,000 Americans will have their loans canceled. Round two is about to get underway soon at the Masters. After round one, Bryson DeChambeau leads at seven under. Tiger Woods is one under after 13 before play was suspended. Global News 24 hours a day and whenever you want it with the Bloomberg News Now. I'm Michael Barr. This is Bloomberg. Tom, Damian, Lisa. Audible. We'll talk to Mets baseball here in the next hour. We got into the Masters now. I love this guy. He's a physics major. Tell me, Damien, about DeChambeau. Yeah. All his clubs are the same length. That's brilliant. Well, I know. Hey, look, it, it, he makes it look so easy. I mean, he reaches on every par five. He's there in two. He's there in two. So he's got, he's got a natural advantage when he's coming off the tee like that. And, you know, if he's putting the way he's been putting, I mean, 65, I mean, that's seven under to lead. Yeah. But Scheffler's right behind him. I mean, yeah. I mean that was sleepy Scheffler yeah. at his finest. And so. he's always been great, Scheffler, yeah. at, at the Masters. But help us here. I mean, I mean, Michael Barr and I don't have a real life okay. like you. You're out. You're Scheffler's out. been working many, on his putting. He's back. How many times a week are you out on the green? How, how on the course? Uh, you know, I, I try to get out there once a week. Oh, he's lying. <laughs> <three times. laughs> Work from golf course. <laughs> Damien, his bag, DeChambeau's bag, is absolutely original. All the clubs are the same length. Yep. Uh, that, it's, it's like brilliant. That makes total sense to me. Every time he pulls a club out, he knows what the length is. Is he that... Is that him alone or is Well, I mean, the underlying story here, Tom, from a business of sports perspective, as Michael Barr and I know, is the fact that DeChambeau's on live. He is yeah. not on yeah. the PGA anymore. So the, the fact guys. that we have another live golfer leading the, the, on the leaderboard here, you know, leading it all is a pretty big deal. I mean, let's just talk about Tiger Woods, though, we must, right? Yes. And, One and under with five to play. And, I mean, if but he makes... keep your eye on this because he has to play 23 holes now. Yep, exactly. And he's just and coming he's tired, off that and surgery yep. and, and uh, right. with the ankle. I, I'm just wondering, and this, you know, we're going to find out if he makes the cut today after the end of the day. So We'll have Bloomberg Radio coverage of this. Nice updates of what's going on at the Masters. This is one of the biggest things I've ever been wrong on. Al from New Jersey called me up. He goes, we're doing golf on radio. I said, what are you, out of your minds? <laughs> and it was phenomenal. I heard it you guys talking totally yesterday worked. about the initiation fee at Paul Sweeney's course. Yeah, it's like Sounds, amazing. So, yeah, it's unbelievable. I mean, it's, it's like nothing compared to mine. My so. course is, you know, north, north, <laughs> north. They wanted, my course wanted a case of Jenny Cream Ale. <laughs> That's what they wanted. Are the courses packed? Damien, not yet, not yet, I don't think. I think it's still a little chilly out there, but I bet you in the next few weeks you're going to see a lot of activity for sure. For Nothing sure. like the Detroit public golf course that I used to play on. Man. Municipal. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Nine holes, Masters man. coverage, and of course we'll have the Masters for you. Some highlights and updates here as we get started with a lot of rain uh, in Augusta. It, J.P. Morgan, they're out with earnings trading off, but nevertheless, underneath the headlines, Allison Williams saying some big numbers. Good morning.
Markets, headlines, and breaking news 24 hours a day on Bloomberg Radio, Bloomberg Television, and the Bloomberg Business App. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. From the Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio, I'm Lisa Mateo. Futures are falling. Right now we have NASDAQ futures down three-tenths of a percent, S&P futures down two-tenths of a percent, Dow futures down a tenth of a percent, or 62 points. Over to the two-year yield at 4.90 percent. That's uh, down about five basis points. A 10-year yield at 4.52 percent, and that's down about six basis points. To commodities we go, where Brent crude, $90 a barrel. Traders keeping an eye on how Iran might respond to an attack in Syria last week. And then we go to gold that hit a record right now comex gold above 24,000 we have spot gold at 22,394 over to silver hit the highest in more than 3 years and then copper rose to its highest level since June of 2022 bank earnings still in focus we've already heard from some of them with disappointing results JP Morgan Wells Fargo we have JP Morgan right now down about 2% Wells Fargo is up about half a percent right now We'll turn to tech. Apple, sources saying it's getting ready to overhaul its entire Mac computer line, a new set of in-house processors that are designed to hi highlight AI. And speaking of AI, sources saying XAI looking to raise up to $4 billion in a deal that would value Elon Musk's startup at $18 billion. <clears throat> and finally, Amazon trading at a record. It's last of the five biggest U.S. tech firms to reach an all-time high in that rebound from post-pandemic sell-off. That is your Bloomberg Business Flash. Tom and Damien. Mandy Singh with us on Tech here in the 9 o'clock hour. Damien Sassar in for Paul Sweeney. Damien, I'm, you know, a classical believer. Dr. Copper speaks volumes. Is Copper up because China's uh, doing better? We're getting whispers that China's doing better. A little bit. A little, well, hey, blue sorry button. about that. Uh, blue Detroit, button. Blue button. Sorry. Detroit Lions. <laughs> blue button. <laughs> um, well, yeah, I have to agree with you. I think the fact that copper's up 8.8% year-to-date. I mean, iron ores come back this week also, so that's another kind yeah. of China signal. But the China trade data overnight, Tom, weaker than mm -hmm. expected. And it's not that exports were down 7.5%. It's that imports are down another 1.9%, which just shows that domestic that demand price in China... Though? It's just not good. But I will say this, you know, China is one of just three countries within the Bloomberg Global Aggregate Bond Index that's actually up on the year. So despite the weakness in the yuan, yeah. China bonds are still a good investment. And what's interesting out there, folks, Kristalina Gorgieva getting ready for the IMF meetings made clear she reaffirms a global slowdown. And there's a lot of commodities really pushing against that, including copper just off Valentine's Day. I believe it's up 17 percent. Is it a cocoa moonshot? No, but it's, you know, it's, it, it's, uh, it's notable. We, it's notable. I quote copper. Do you quote Chicago or LME? I do LME. I do LME cash too. I don't I, even I've look at the three-month I've always Chicago because of my grandfather a yeah. million years ago in Chicago. Pharaoh took me to task. HG, HG, uh, HGA, right? HG, HGA, commodity go. HG, one, whatever. Whatever. HG won the first contract. Pharaoh said he wouldn't talk to me about copper unless <laughs> I did LME, so I had to learn to use LME. I, I use the LME. I mean, they made it a little okay. bit easier on the terminal to do that. Now, a look at the front pages. What's making news around the world? Your daily roundup of today's headlines from major publications. Bloomberg Surveillance, our daily newspaper segment, the Lisa Mateo Hour, brought to you by Interactive Brokers. Interactive Brokers, they charge dollar margin load rates from 5.83% to 6.83%. Rates subject to change. Learn more at ibkr.com slash compared. I thought the newspapers were thick with stories today. What did you choose, Lisa? All right. So we're starting with the Wall Street Journal. Have you noticed around the office, we have them a lot here at Bloomberg, couches, right? They're everywhere. Everyone loves the couches. Companies trying to make the offices seem a little bit less stuffy to get people to come back in. Okay. So workers are saying they're more comfortable. Managers are saying it helps them think of these big ideas, you know, but experts are saying it's actually bad for your back and this is the issue with you know you're balancing this laptop as you're trying to sit on the sofa and then you know that can be an issue and then it's also becoming more expensive in a way because people are not taking care of their sofas so they're spilling their coffee they're eating their food so now the companies have to make this expense and have the are sofas cleaned every so often <laughs> What, what, your your pretzels are all over the place. Every day, 10.05, <laughs> and I'm on with the Cheez-Its. Yes. And, you know, I, I, I clean up after myself with the Cheez-Its. 
this is Sir Damien. What do you think here? Uh, <laughs> As he got? opens no, his no, bag. As I open no, my no. bag of chips. Oh, 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 what a shock. Look, I think, I think companies have long tried to make the office a little bit less stuffy. They do, uh, you know, they have restaurants, outdoor terraces. They, ha yes. they have signature scents. You know, these little diffusers in the office to make it smell. Smell nice. Smell nice. We mm -hmm. have that in my house. My wife loves that stuff. Ooh. Yeah, no, it's, it smells beautiful in my house. Do we got to get roses. one of those in what here. Are you, are you doing Hermes, <laughs> Dior? You know, what's up? <laughs> no, it's a, um, it's like that hotel collection. I don't know. I might have got us my wife. That's I mean, what it does. Yeah, I gotta ask my interpreter. You know, she she controls my Lisa, bank account. Lisa, what do you think? Because I mean, this is a huge debate where people are saying people are saying that we're we're coming back to the office, mm -hmm. and Paul and I were really pushing against it. We're not sure we see it Monday. Tuesday yeah, we or don't say it, it's it Mondays and Fridays. It still seems kind of quiet around here, but yeah. you know Tuesday through Thursday. I I think everyone just needs to kind of come back. I don't know. I'm kind of a in little that aromatherapy Maybe goes it's a long way. I have to do it, so we're, I feel like everybody little, exactly. else should. Exactly. I think we're a little biased. <laughs> what do you got next? Okay, the battle between boomers and millennials. It's starting to see this shift because millennials are now going to start competing with other millennials. Here's the reason why, okay. So when they first entered the adult world, 2010s, right? So they bonded, they have this against adversity because it's harder for them to save for homes, right? So they bonded together, millennials. Yes, they're going against the boomers, but now it's changing. Boomers starting to fade and force. The new competition, here's the reason. Millennials who have benefited from family wealth so you see the competition, the tension there. So now you have these millennials who can't afford to buy, buy their home, but you have these other millennials who can because their parents gave them the money for it. What do you think? So it's this tension. I, I think the interesting statistic here, I mean, Lisa, is the fact that the average millennial had 30, has 30% 30 less wealth than the average yes. boomer by the age of 35. That's an amazing right. statistic. Yeah. And, and I mean, boomers, they owned homes. Right. They had you know home equity wealth, whereas, you know, I mean, today's uh, millennial I don't think owns all that much real estate. This is the first time I've mentioned it. We're going to feature this on Monday with bank earnings today and a really full schedule, which is going to slide it to Monday. Bloomberg News has done the absolutely definitive research project on majors in colleges. Mm -hmm. And to me, the divide, Lisa, is people that went to college like Damien Sassauer and got a real degree versus a lot of other people that just sort of slid through and they got this degree or that degree. Mm -hmm. And to me, that's the millennial divide, yeah, no. is people with you know a legit STEM, a high energy degree. In the Bloomberg research, Paulina Kacheka has this, the, the Bloomberg research is absolutely definitive. We'll feature that on Monday, yeah. next. And, and it's tough because colleges are so expensive too. So that's There's the that, other she, side she of the She folds thing. that into it with oh, her team. Let's pay $400,000 to be a major in sociology. That's fun. Think, yeah, that works. It's going to work for you. There yeah. you go. You'll love radio. Uh, so, so speaking of colleges, this is where I want to shift to. A lot more elite schools, they're returning to those standardized tests. So now Harvard, yeah, Caltech, they're you. starting to bring back the SATs. Um, Harvard kind of did this backtrack. They were going to make it optional for a few more years but they changed their mind caltech did the same thing um so mm -hmm. they're starting to bring it back but the shift started to happen which is interesting after the supreme court ruling that schools can't consider race and admissions and this is where things uh, started to shift a little bit damien, that's what the article what saying damien's living this in real time oh yeah i mean i look i mean all i know is um I, i'm a fan of standardized tests i do i think you need that number to kind of differentiate you know the cream from the crop and you know so i'm a fan of it but at the end of the day if i had a weaker uh, a student who a son or daughter who wasn't yeah. a great test taker i, I understand that it's it, it can be a, a pretty big ass to ask them to sit down to spend hundreds of dollars on tutors Lisa. for the SAT, I was for the just ACT. Say, I Man, just the spent hundreds is... of dollars on okay. tutors. <laughs> Granted, COVID was in the way, yes. but I've had too many professors tell me it's been an unmitigated disaster. They, they, you know, finally Harvard's catching up with Dartmouth and Brown and, and all the rest. And there'll be a, a zillion of this. Right. like MIT and Georgetown leading the way on this day. Yeah, absolutely. But, but we'll the, the bottom line is professors say they got kids in class. They just can't do the, the work. Program. That's the bottom line. Well, did you see Ken Griffin is donating money to the public school system down in Miami to address just this issue because yeah. the, the COVID kids, ages who are in grades six to yeah. eight, you know, are, are suffering. Yeah. Lisa Mateo, thank you. Just really strong newspapers all through the week there. Lisa Mateo uh, with one of our most popular uh, efforts. We are out on Apple CarPlay. Uh, just thrilled with that. We're out on YouTube and we're jaw dropped over the performance. Thank you so much. You search Bloomberg Podcast. Look for Leas Lisa Mateo's uh, gorgiosity. That's on the new uh, chiclet there uh, as well. So we're looking for uh, YouTube. 
uh, Bloomberg Podcasts, and of course, Damien Sessa are with us today um, as uh, well. It is a Friday. We're staggering on through to the weekend <laughs> and into a very busy week before a Fed meeting. We're going to do a lot more on that. Michael Purvis scheduled uh, to be with us, among other worries. It's Friday. Damien's in love. Boys Lisa's don't cry. in love. Vet Mills in love. Friday, I'm in love. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen and Paul Sweet. Why are we upset if we're creating jobs? Inflation is still a thing out there for the everyday consumer. With Lisa Mateo on markets. The economic calendar jam-packed today. And Michael Barr with news. Tensions between the U.S. and China have heated up even more. The best in economics, finance, investment, and international relations. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on Bloomberg Radio. 
Good morning, everyone. Paul Sweeney and Tom Keen, Bloomberg Surveillance. Sweeney on assignment. It's got the Gulf Stream somewhere. <laughs> Greifeld was scheduled. Gus came down with the flu, so she's, you know, yeah. out hanging out with Gus the horse. Last man's standing. Short straw, Damien Sassauer, yeah, in today on an eventful Friday. Thank you, Terry Haynes on Iran. That's what we're watching in international relations this morning. What are we watching in the markets here on Apple CarPlay? On YouTube, search Bloomberg Podcast. I'm sorry, Damien, into the weekend. In Monday morning in Japan is 7 p.m. Sunday evening in America. Will they act? They're going to get their leader back from the state dinner. How was the state dinner? I, I, you know, I missed that one. You know, I, I heard it was delicious, actually. They had like a tuna tartare, a little yeah, appetizer, a little, little, you know, little, little little taste cocktail. Of I used Mary Lincoln's, uh, Mary Todd Lincoln's China. Right. Um, D Damien, what are we going to see from the, the, the institutions in Japan once they get Kishida back to uh, Tokyo? Again, as we broke through that 152 level in dollar yen, you know, there's a, a lot of speculation that the BOJ is going to have to come in there and support the currency. I expect it to do that. The question is when and just how much. Do they sterilize? This is way too oh, much for the top word. of the show. Great adjective there. But there's, there's two ways to do uh, interventions here. Do they get fancy or do they just do it? Well, I, I think they just do it. I mean, look, I don't expect them to start buying ETFs all over again. I think they're going to try and be tactical and strategic about it, but they're going to have to provide support in some way just to get some of these uh, market moves off its back. We digress quickly here. We've got to keep the show going to get to Michael Purvis. Citigroup is out with earnings. Citigroup is not J.P. Morgan, is it, Damien Cesar? Uh, no, but it's still a pretty big bank. you got to pay attention to it. And certainly, you know, some of the stuff for me and EM that's going on in Mexico, I think they're trying to divest of their exposure there. I I'm interested to hear what's going on on that front. I mean, it's going to be uh, rev revenues. We're getting some comparison right now. The headlines are rosing out. The stock goes up 1.2% versus what we saw pulling back a little bit on J.P. Morgan. I haven't even had long. time to look at Wells Fargo. Total loans uh, came in a little light. That will be interesting. The FIC trading came in pretty much on, on the screws, target. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, oh, that's, not, that's, that's Wall Street talk, right? <laughs> on the screws. Net interest income, $13.5 I don't have an estimate for that, but yeah, that seems... It's a movable, uh, it's a movable feast. We'll dive into that, but let's keep the show uh, rolling here. From the Interactive Brokers Studio with our Bloomberg Business Flash, Lisa Mateo. Good morning. Equity features lower after big bank earnings. You talked about it. Starting to trickle in. Let's start there. So we've already heard from some of them. We have disappointed results from JP Morgan Wells Fargo JP Morgan missing on loans expenses right now JP Morgan down about 2% we have Wells Fargo up about half a percent BlackRock they're up 2% long-term investment funds took in 76 billion of net inflows in the first quarter that's pushing it to a record ten and a half trillion dollars of client assets you have State Street they're up 2% right now adjusted earnings per share net interest income that first quarter that beat estimates and then you have Citigroup they're up about 2% right now over to the two-year yield at 4.89%. That's down about six basis points. You have the 10-year yield at 4.52%, and that's down about six basis points. On the currency front, want to point out the pound drops below 125, the lowest level since uh, November. Then you have the euro drop to the weakest level against a dollar in five months. That is your Bloomberg Business Flash. Tom and Damien. Bloomberg surveillance this morning brought to you by Cohn Resnick. Advisory Assurance Tax, Cohn Resnick's Enterprise Risk Management Solutions can help your company drive value through stronger compliance and reporting procedures. Visit KohnResnick.com. Major shout out. Thank you, Cohn Resnick, for enduring support of, of what we do. There's what I wanted to see. Citigroup, return on average common equity. 6.6%. .6%. JP Morgan, I believe the compare was 15%. I'm making that up. but It's still better than estimate. I think they were, the, the, the yes. uh, ROE was supposed I, to be 5%. So, yeah. I, I, My major message, folks, is these are not all banks bundled together. They each have their own character, their own profitability. We're going to digress now. We do this with Dow 38,600, 5,200 SPX with Michael Purvis, synthesizing this all together. I think about like three years ago, you wrote two paragraphs in Asia DXY were like poetry about the Pacific Rim in, in, in that. What's that three paragraph poetry you're going to write for Monday morning? What's the thing you're focused on? Uh, well, you know, just broadly, I think, you know, 
one of the things that, you know, I've been very constructive on risk assets like equities here, right, coming into this year. It's a, I, I call it the dual Goldilocks condition where you had the Fed pivoting in December. It's, it's a pivot with a whole bunch of footnotes, but it's a pivot nonetheless um, combined with a strong worker consumer, right? You know, to have that is, is a risk on thing. That said, I think your colleague, uh, uh, Gina Martin Adams point. Uh, she was on fire yesterday. Yeah, and, and, she, and she, she also posted a great chart on Twitter, I believe, just showing the technicals and the S and P 500 starting to get a little bit overdone. The upward momentum there, and this is a signal that I've been focused on as well. It looks like we're kind of due for some sell and may go away, some consolidation in Q2. So. Um, you know, I don't have a good earnings bear case, broadly speaking, to articulate right now. Um, you know, we've had some higher than in, uh, expected inflation reports, and I expect some higher than an inflation, uh, some inflationary push on the earnings side as well, certainly the top line. And if they can continue to defend their margins, then we might see earnings be okay there. But I do think that um, the, the, the sort of the big risk I'm worried about, Tom, is, is and I'm not saying this is a base case here, but We've had a push higher in yields, and if, if we just start seeing traders jump on this, we've had a slow motion treasury sell off. And if, if that is, goes from second gear to fourth gear, like we saw last September, combined with sort of a commodity surge or, or an extension yeah. of this commodity surge, right. that could be the recipe for some risk off. But again, it doesn't have to be a massive derailing of the yeah. entire. Uh, right. Market, but 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 the cause for yeah. you know maybe a five to ten percent pullback. Michael, you mentioned the move in yields, driven by break evens, driven by inflation expectations. Right. We know what that means. That's good for gold. And you're a little bit of a closet gold bug. I mean, Tom, <laughs> did you know that Michael's a closet <laughs> I, gold bug? He is recommending that you buy GDX call spreads here. I mean, talk to us a little bit. September, by the way, we have till September. So you think there's still some legs to this rally in gold, eh? Well, you know, it's interesting. You were talking about gold earlier uh, in the show uh, there that has, you know, squeaked out fresh lifetime highs again. One of the interesting things here is that gold volatility here, usually you see gold volatility flame up with these kinds of rallies. It's not, no. right? And so it, it gets to this point about what's been the backbone of this rally. It's, you were, it's what you were talking about. It's the bank of Poland. Yeah, it's exactly. official sector buying. ETF ounces held. If you look at all the ounces held in the, in the gold, that's been plummeting. Here. Yeah. So it's not a Wall Street driven rally. And what I'm wondering is, is, you know, whether this rally starts pivoting to a different type of rally, more of a Wall Street rally. Right? Well, now that's what I wanted to ask. I mean, talk to me about the other precious metals that really have not participated in this yeah. move, silver, platinum, palladium, et cetera. Talk to us a little bit about some of those other sort of surrogates for gold. Do you see any value there? Yeah, well, certainly. I mean, look, silver, you know, think about it this way, you know, in, in uh, 2011, gold made a lifetime high of uh, 1921 in September of that year. Silver had reached as high as 50 um, there, and then both metals went into a bear market. Right now, silver Silver has struggled to get through 30 over the last three years, and gold has made, you know, new lifetime highs here um, that are that are substantially higher than where they were in 2011 here. So gold-silver ratio has been rolling over here. It, you know, could get a lot lower yeah. here. The key level to watch in silver is 30. If it breaks there, right. then you have an air pocket to 35, 36. We digress, Lisa. We're talking metals here, platinum, gold. Which do you like better? I mean, if I look at a Tiffany wedding ring, are you thinking platinum or are you thinking gold? No, I'm going regular gold. I can't gold. do the platinum. Right. You gotta go. You gotta White go. White gold, right. rosé, rosé, rose gold. <laughs> you gotta go the tougher carrot. Gold. You don't go this fourteen carrots. You gotta go like, you know, the the, the gold, whichever gold is yes. the one that's tougher. I gotta, I gotta. You, you can scratch it in the dishwasher. I mean, that's <laughs> others. I want to go to the both of you. I'm interviewing both of you right now. I got a massive strong renminbi move against this ridiculous weak yen. Mm -hmm. Michael Burvis, you've been brilliant on the Pacific Rim. Damien, you bread and potatoes okay, every day. Give me a link here between renminbi and, and yen, Japanese yen. You, Damien, I'll give start. Me, sure. Me, I mean, look, yeah. both companies have uh, both companies. Sorry, goodness. Both economies have very, very low yields. They are low yielders, meaning, you know, if you want to take risk in other parts of the market and use the yuan or the Japanese yen as your funding currency, that's what a lot of investors have been Do you, doing, especially given the low volatility. Okay, but do you really? think Michael yeah. Purvis is a jump condition coming? I mean, I'm looking at the chart back 30 years of of uh, yuan strength. Something's got to give. Yeah. Well, certainly, you know, there are some inklings. I mean, you didn't see, I think Damien pointed out earlier in the morning that this, the economic data we just got doesn't doesn't spell like, you know, massive Chinese resurgence here. But certainly a lot of the bad has been priced in here and a little bit will go a long way. 
um, uh, right. you, you know, there. But I, I think the overarching theme here is that the dollar, you know, all these currency pairs you were talking about, you started, you were, you know, the euro, you know, has, has, has got a 106. Is that 106 and change yeah. here right now, right? I mean, the dollar is really sort of the right. central thing. And I think right. in a lot of these emerging economies, right. they're sort of like, you know, what's going on right. in your currency? What's going on in your yeah. economy? What's going on in your elections? Michael Purvis, come back for two blocks. Got to got to go longer. <laughs> DXY is going to print 106 before Purvis leaves uh, the Michael Barr Studios, as we say. Uh, futures improve off J.P. Morgan. Negative 22 has become negative 15. Citigroup with a modest lift. With our news in New York City, here's Michael Barr. Thank you very much, Tom, Damien, and Lisa. A U.S. official says it is expecting a major attack by Iran against Israel as soon as today. The official told CBS the attack could include more than 100 drones, dozens of cruise missiles, and perhaps ballistic missiles, as well as will be aimed at military targets in Israel. The official went on to say it's going to be challenging for the Israelis to defend against an attack of that magnitude. It would be in retaliation for last week's attack on an Iranian consulate in Syria that Tehran blames on Israel. Secretary of State Antony Blinken has been making calls to foreign counterparts in Turkey, China, and Saudi Arabia, asking them to urge Iran to de-escalate. State Department spokesman Matthew Miller says those aren't the only countries they've contacted. We have also engaged with European allies and partners over the past few days and urged them as well to send a clear message to Iran that an escalation is not in Iran's interest, it's not in the region's interest, and it's not in the world's interest. Spokesman Matthew Miller. The spy community is waiting to hear if Congress will renew the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. Republicans emerged from a meeting last night confident they can pass a revised version of FISA. President Biden is chipping away at student debt once again. We get the details on the latest move from Bloomberg government Zach Cohen in Washington. The Biden administration did uh, say it will forgive another $7.4 billion uh, in debt under its current SAVE program, sort of the income driven repayment program that is moving forward um, and has helped uh, hundreds of thousands of Americans uh, get their debts even, uh, even erased at this point. Bloomberg government Zach Cohen reports this latest move will cover about 277,000 Americans. Round one of the Masters is finishing up this morning. Bryson DeChambeau leads at 7-under. Global News 24 hours a day and whenever you want it with Bloomberg News Now. I'm Michael Barr. This is Bloomberg. Tom, Damian, Lisa. 162 games in the season. I have a cardinal rule. I don't think about the Major League Baseball until they get 10% of the games in. Okay. I'm going to break the rule right Let's now. Hear it. <laughs> the hitting power machine known as the New York Mets. <laughs> This weekend has the almost first place win eight in a row Kansas City Royals in. How, how can we even predict that the Royals-Mets would be the best pairing of the weekend? I mean, could you see that score of the Mets-Braves game? I mean, all the Mets The fans, Braves. I, the Mets beat the Braves 16-4 to four yesterday. I mean, that is some That display. is a touchdown and three field goals. And can so I say how happy I am for Bobby Witt Jr.? <laughs> who had the gumption to sign a mega deal in Kansas and stay there. Every other agent would have said move to New York, right? Well, look, I mean, I, I, I imagine he's not having an argument right. with his interpreter either. But, you know, I, I guess, well, you know, I, I, have, I had to check my bank accounts after this whole Shohei Otani thing. And I realized I had, that my interpreter was taking out. Oh, that's my wife. Yeah. Sorry, she was in there. So. I had to talk yesterday. Jason Kelly, thank you so much. It was great to chat up A-Rod yesterday.
markets, headlines, and breaking news 24 hours a day on Bloomberg Radio, Bloomberg Television, and the Bloomberg Business App. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. From the Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio, I'm Lisa Mateo. Futures still pointing to a lower open after big bank earnings, but also the latest economic data changing views on interest rates. You have economists at Deutsche Bank, Bank of America, saying that the Fed will ease policy just once this year. That'll be in December. And then the Fed, Susan Collins, saying that there could be fewer cuts this year. For today, we'll get a report on import prices for March and also a read on sentiment. Right now, we have NASDAQ futures down four-tenths of a percent, S&P futures down three-tenths of a percent, Dow futures down two tenths of a percent or 78 points. The two-year yield at 4.89 percent. That's down about seven basis points. The 10-year yield at 4.51 percent and that's down about seven basis points. A quick check on banks with earnings season kicking off. We have JP Morgan down two percent. Wells Fargo down nearly a percent. BlackRock and State Street <coughs> both up about two percent. Citigroup one percent. We got to hit tech right now. Please. Intel, AMD, they're both down by about two percent. Here's the reason why. There was a report from the Wall Street Journal, China telling its telecom carriers to phase out foreign ships by 2027. That is your Bloomberg Business Flash. Tom and Damien. Lisa Mateo, thank you so much. Uh, the team really works for me to try to bring you voices from another time and place. I've been calling the two Octobers ago bull market lift, the Ralph Ankampora Edward Yardeni bull market, those two legends, uh, were way out front in this in different ways, technical and fundamental. And I, I, this week is a rich week to do this because with a solar eclipse, so many of you were mentioning to me the pioneer group's founder and legend, Philip Carre, who loved solar eclipses, uh, had a, a nice relationship with my father, and far more was a legend in value investing. Some would say he and John Templeton, uh, Damien, pretty much invented how we do this. I saw that picture of the total eclipse that your father tested. Very beautiful. cool. Very Chuck, cool. Chuck, it was a long time, uh, it was a, 1979. Chuck Clow invented what you think equity strategy is. He was at Merrill Lynch, before that he was a colonial adjacent to Pioneer in Boston, and he literally single-handedly invented what we take for granted today. We are honored that Mr. Clow will join us uh, this morning. Chuck Clow, is there too much equity strategy now? What you wrought, is there just too much people guessing and gaming the market? Well, that's a... Uh... <laughs> Uh, that, that's a subjective question. Um, there's a lot more of it. And um, I think most everybody's understood the, how the credit cycle works. Um, I, I, I do think trying to predict when the Fed will first reduce interest rates is kind of a frustrating and unproductive effort. So, you know, we, we, we try to look at long term uh, credit, act, right. credit factors and, and productivity gains and um, that that's always still been a, a pretty useful way of looking at things. But yeah, there's a lot of folks right. trying to work the credit the credit market. Chuck Claw, I've been saying to people that there's whispers here of coming out of 74, 75, the first big lift, and then 77, a seg second big lift. Are we in the second leg of a bull market? I think we are. Um, I, I think there's two things that... Um, that really prop up equities as we look through the rest of the decade. And of course, I'm looking beyond beyond this week. Uh, one is productivity. Productivity is clearly driving profits. Um, and disinflation, which has been going on for 40 years, it was interrupted a bit by the COVID response and, and the liquidity that was thrown into the economy from that standpoint. Um, but I, I think when you look at uh, how, how things look longer term, remember interest rates and inflation came down for 40 years. And then, of course, COVID interrupted. So the question is, what were the reasons they came down? Yeah. And are those reasons still good? And I think the reasons are largely demographics, uh, what balance sheets look like in the private sector, which are still pretty large and heavily liability oriented. And thirdly, productivity. Those uh, those are still there. So we, we think that uh, long process of uh, disinflation and interest rates um, continues looking forward so, so chuck, it's to us it looks like a pretty positive environment for equity so chuck you're bullish on equities but i really want to know is are you bullish on boston college's chances to take on denver in the div one men's ice hockey national championship on saturday you are a bc alum no i'm just kidding but yeah i'd love to talk about that with you after the fact but talk to me a little bit sure. about utilities some, some of these rate sensitive equity sectors that have just not participated in the move it's been all magnificent seven talk to us about some of these 
other sectors? Are they going to participate in this move? Well, I, I think they can. Um, their productivity drives profits, as, as I suggested. And one of the things that uh, is, uh, first of all, I, I don't think the fangs are done. I, I, I think large cap tech um, will, will continue to perform well. And the reason is simple. Never in the history of the world has an industry, and especially the major ones, generated the kind of cash flow margins that they do. And, and the other thing um, is, is you have to realize that, 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 that there are only two survivors from the dot-com bust of 24 years ago, uh, Intel and Microsoft. But uh, the ones, the companies that grew up in the internet, Amazon, Google, Microsoft in particular, every time technology changed, they were dominant. Uh, when the cloud came, they were the dominant factors. And now that AI is coming, they're the dominant yeah. factors. But I do think that a, a broad portfolio makes a lot more sense right. today. I, I think value will do better. Um, and I think that largely because interest rates are coming yeah. down and, and productivity is so good. So I, I think a balanced portfolio matters, but I wouldn't I wouldn't move away from tech. Chuck Cloud, long ago and far away. And, you know, good morning, Gerard Cassidy. We hope to get him on from Tucker Anthony and RL Day. <laughs> We're talking ancient history here. Yeah, right. You knew Chuck Clow, a young whippersnapper at Fidelity. He was in the coattails of Peter Lynch by the name of Will Danoff. And he's done better sure. than good running the Contra mm -hmm. Fund at Fidelity. How do you respond to someone like Will Danoff, who at gunpoint is forced to have 54% of his fund in his top 10 holdings? Is that a topsy-turvy world to Chuck Clow? Well, the market has been you know, very narrow, and that's been the right strategy as long as your top 10 holdings were in the tech area. Um, I think there are other industries that can participate. I, I, I like aerospace defense. I think natural gas has a good, uh, a, a good outlook. So um, we, let's see, we, we're not quite that, uh, that uh, intensively focused, but um, uh, it's, it's, if, you, if you do it right, yeah. it's, a, it's a good strategy and Will's the right. best at it. Damien, get one more in here. No, I mean, Chuck, you know, for me, it's all mag seven, right? And if I look at those stocks and their outperformance, it's been largely an interest rate story, right? I mean, expectations that the Fed's going to cut, that those long duration assets, those mm -hmm. equities are going are gonna to rally off the back of it. But I mean, that just doesn't seem to be the case this time, right? I mean, talk to us why equities and some, certainly the mag seven are diverging from what we're seeing in the interest rate market here. Um, I, I, I don't think the MAG-7 will, will, will fall behind here. Uh, and, and it's more than, than interest rates here. I mean, interest rates have gone up and they've, they, they've continued to outperform. Uh, and, and I think the reason is never in the history of the world have we seen this kind of, of, of cash flow generation. They're platform companies, um, they're low capital costs. Uh, they already have a, a dominant position in, in, in what they do that's uh, virtually impregnable. So I, I, I don't I don't think that um, that game is over right. at all. And if interest rates come down, right. I, I think that's another uh, that certainly creates a better backdrop for them. What I do think, though, is that if we're right and, and, and productivity continues to drive products, there will be other sectors. So we, we just think looking right. taking a balanced view is, is the right way to do. You don't have quite the extremes of uh, either excessive uh, growth stock or excessive value. Um, stock uh, outperformance that uh, to work with it, it's kind of an equal right. it's kind of an equal draw right now so uh, right. we we do think the fangs will continue to outperform right. but others will come on Chuck Clow, thank you so much greatly appreciated Chuck Clow, forever with Merrill Lynch among others I'm like how you mentioned Frozen Four I mean <laughs> Denver went through BU by overtime one yes goal. four to three in October but I was thunderstruck that Boston College what they they tore apart Michigan I mean I just didn't expect that. Freshman Will Smith extended his national lead on points with two goals. He has yeah. 71 goals on the season. I mean, we Freshman. were hoping bean pot, you know, Boston College, Boston University, Final Four. But, you know, DU, Boston College oh, is DU classic. Is real. Yeah, it's This classic. is like original six in the NHL. Absolutely. It's the serious yeah. stuff. It's a, I'm, should I not watch the Masters and watch Frozen Four instead? Well, it's Saturday at 6 p.m., so you'll yeah. probably, I mean, Masters will almost. Yeah, you know, we'll catch a bit. Yeah, we'll see. What an honor to have Chuck Clow, and that's what Bloomberg Surveillance is like. Eric, thank you. Thank you for uh, getting Mr. Clow in. He is truly a legend. So is Damien Sassar. We're going to continue here. Well, I don't even know if we have economic data in four minutes. We'll tell you about it. What we got is bank earnings and to reset the look ahead towards Fed meeting. On Apple CarPlay, on YouTube, search Bloomberg Podcast. There's a very live chat. Bloomberg Surveillance. Good morning.
markets, headlines, and breaking news 24 hours a day on Bloomberg Radio, Bloomberg Television, and the Bloomberg Business App. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. From the Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio, I'm Lise Mateo. Futures falling. We have NASDAQ futures leading the losses right now, down about half a percent. S&P futures down three-tenths of a percent. Dow futures down about two-tenths of a percent. The two-year yield is lower at 4.901 percent, and that's down about five basis points. The 10-year yield at 4.53 percent, and that's down about six basis points. To commodities, we have Brent crude at $90 a barrel, and over to gold, COMEX gold, more than 2000 400 an ounce and we have spot gold at 2395 an ounce amazon trading at a record it's the last of the five biggest u.s tech firms to reach an all-time high in that rebound from that post-pandemic sell-off and then sources are saying samsung getting ready to take the wraps off a 44 billion dollar investment in u.s chip making as soon as next week right. want to make a quick check on banks jp morgan down two percent wells fargo down about half a percent blackrock up two percent same for state street citigroup up more than percent as well that is your bloomberg business flash tom and david lisa perfect there in samsung to me the headline of the week was taiwan semiconductor with the first mm -hmm. look at earnings which were better than good chris out on live chat nails it i will quote chris in entirety apple is coming off the bench and getting ready to play hard what a shock damien sassauer by our mark german yesterday mm -hmm. definitive on the new m4 machine apple was being apple you know the dregs sure. as it's been for six months it went up four percent on a german moonshot you know what came uh, and, and some other stories in tech i mean china's telling its own telecom carriers domestically they need to phase out foreign chips i mean intel amd forget about it they yeah, cannot sell their chips to china done. yeah exactly you need but, two nanometers but in the same breath president out. she's trying to draw in you know u.s companies bring jamie diamond right. over you know tell them it's great over here we're gonna have to see our economic indicator is at 8 30 okay not on friday but you know cpi ppi they lead our coverage <laughs> economic indicators always brought by commonwealth supporting more than 2,000 independent financial advisors with the solutions they need to grow a thriving business commonwealth go where you grow visit commonwealth.com to learn more. Kelvin C. joins us right now. He's with BNP Paribas, the giant Paris bank. And what you've got to know is the heritage of BNP Paribas in China and across the Pacific Rim is second uh, to none. Kelvin, I, I just want to get to Yen here. I'm going to ask one question because Damien's got like, you know, he's got a value line of notes for you. <laughs> where, where does Yen go given dollar resiliency? How does Yen appreciate even if they change the institutional policy? Thanks so much for having me, Tom and Damien. We are still bullish on dollar yen. The fundamentals continue to point to the upside. The combination of uh, Fed that's probably going to be finding it quite difficult to cut rates means right. that, that differential between the U.S. and Japan will remain wide. Okay, well, give me a number here. It's Friday. I need a number. Give me a data point. Where is dollar yen going? Our forecasts. Um, suggest that dollar yen um, is uh, is likely to remain at around these levels. We're in the process of, of updating such forecasts. Oh, there we um, go. With the new information that we got this week. <laughs> and we're not uh, going to hear know, it first here at Bloomberg Surveillance. Damien, Calvin, save he, the he, interview. Don't listen to Tom. He's, he's, he's throwing loaded questions at you. Let me throw you a softball here. We've seen diverging price pressures between the U.S. and the rest of the world. Is that going to actually fuel central bank divergence? I mean, is the ECB actually going to cut before the Fed? Can Christine Lagarde pull that off? And further to that point, we've seen a lot of emerging market central banks cutting already. Just how much runway do they have to ease, uh, to ease monetary policy here? That is exactly in line with what we are expecting. I don't think that it's going to be that big of a surprise for the ECB to be cutting before the Fed. Mm -hmm. The data that we've gotten over the last few months has opened the door really for the ECB to begin cutting rates in June. And the CPI number this week was a huge surprise. We've yeah. now had three bad CPI prints in a row. And with that, we think the Fed's gonna find it very difficult to cut rates anytime soon. So we've actually changed our forecasts on the Fed we were previously looking for a rate cut starting in June, another cut in September, another cut in December, and we've changed that to only expecting two cuts this year, looking for the first to come in July and the next to come in December. So that monetary policy divergence, as you highlight, we think will continue to underpin the U.S. dollar. 
Calvin, can carry continue to deliver? I mean, look, let's be clear. G10 carry is up 5.3% year to date. I mean, that's a pretty nice number considering we're only three, three and a half months into the year. Talk to us a little bit about carry and talk to us about what funding currencies stand out for you in this environment. We mentioned China Yuan. Is that one of them? We continue to like carry. Carry is measured not just on the absolute amount of carry you earn, but also how that carry looks from a volatility-adjusted perspective. Right. And the first few weeks of April, seasonally, tend to be quite dampening for FX volatility. So based on our right. metrics, FX carry <coughs> continues to look very attractive. We continue to like the dollar, especially against the majors. We like the dollar right. against the euro, against the yen. The fundamentals are pointing in that direction. And you earn carry in that as well. As you suggest, we think that the yen uh, is going to be one of the primary currencies that we like funding with, as well as the okay. RMB. Yeah. In terms of the long side, we continue to like the dollar, as I mentioned, and we really like Mexico as well. Okay, I, you know, this is like Nerd Patrol. I got Damien Sassar <laughs> and Kelvin C. They're going at it, folks. For those of you, that was half in Greek. <laughs> But, you know, you know we'll, we'll play Kansas, carry on my wayward son here, so we figure out what carry is. Kelvin, let's go prosaic here. The Olympics are in four weeks. Am I going to see a persistently, persistently weak euro? So when Mrs. Keene at the, you know, the games goes to Louis Vuitton to buy a bag, she's going to be able to do it. Am I going to see a 104 euro? We think that the euro will remain weak. We think the euro will remain weak for <laughs> three primary reasons. The first is as we just highlighted, monetary policy divergence between the Fed and ECB we think will continue to be a key theme in the markets, with the ECB cutting earlier and more than the Fed this year. Secondly, uh, as well, um, the fundamentals are beginning to weigh increasingly on the euro area, with higher commodity prices, the euro area being a net commodity importer, as opposed to the U.S. that is a net commodity exporter, is going to weigh right. on Europe's fundamentals. And then third, uh, last but not least, again, this theme of, uh, of, of carry, we do believe that investors are going to, by and large, find it quite difficult to want to be long the euro when you have to See, pay to is, be long. This is the difference, folks. This is the real world. For those of you out on YouTube, Lisa Mateo and I, we're in the same planet here. <laughs> I'm just trying to figure out with a 104 euro how bad I get taken at 30 Montagna uh, with Dior. Like, you know, a new Dior bag. You guys are talking carry. So here's what, what is carry? Explain Damien Sassauer to mere mortals what carry is. Well, in, in, its, in its truest sense, if you're a U.S. dollar investor, it's carry over and above whatever you know rate you're getting here in the U.S., any sort of incremental up. We have high yield. rates now. And we have high rates, so you're not getting a lot of carry over and above U.S. But, you know, here's what I, I Calvin, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, we saw a lot of CPI prints this week. And from what I can tell, Chile, Mexico, Brazil, China, Taiwan, all came in soft. We just saw soft CPI out of France right now. Shout out to Michael Bachman, BNP Paribas. Talk to us about all this soft inflation there. Where is it coming from? What is driving inflation down? When here in the U.S., we're experiencing something that's exactly the opposite of it. The United States is in a very interesting situation right now where what we're experiencing around the world is an environment where inflation is moderating quite significantly from its highs uh, a couple of years ago. And that inflation moderation is happening in large part because we are seeing um, some very significant supply chain healing and lower goods prices. In the United States, however, the economy is still very, very hot. Yep. We just added over 300,000 jobs to the economy last Friday, as you saw. And with that, what we're seeing in the U.S. right now is that core services inflation, things like getting a haircut, things that you don't physically right. buy, uh, still remains quite hot. And that, we think, is a worry for the Fed because right. that services inflation tends to be stickier, right. which is another reason why we think the Fed is going to have to... Right wait a bit longer before it could begin its easing cycle. Kelvin C., thank you so much. With BMP Paribas, that was a real primer, folks, seriously, for Global Wall Street. Damien, I want to take one minute here. I think it's so, so important. Dollar Max mm -hmm. level was a 19 pre-pandemic. Mm -hmm. Ugly, world's coming to an end, out That's to 26. Right. And we've had a one-way move from 26 pesos per dollar down to a stunning, strong Mexican peso. Mm -hmm. How is Mexico different now from my stereotype of Mexico? Do you know what the policy rate in Mexico is today? It's 11%.
what is it here in the U.S.? It's five and a half percent. So look at all that cushion. We talk about carry over and above the U.S. Well, Mexico's one. Place I want to buy Mexican it. peso to pick up that six percentage point differential. And that's right. If you were to move your money out of dollars into Mexican peso and then reinvest in deposit rates, which should be around eleven percent, you would think in Mexico if you just deposit it in a local bank. You know, that's what you're. That's what I'm talking about. That's it. That's the trick when you want to get carry right. in emerging markets. That's that's the whole trick. What we try to do here. This has been the hallmark of Bloomberg surveillance for. I don't know how long we've been doing this, three, four years. Uh, the hallmark here is we like explain the jargon as best we can. I let <laughs> Damien and Kelvin see there. That was a pro discussion with some real nuance to it. Speaking of pro news, futures at negative 25 with our news in New York City, Michael Barr. Thank you very much, Tom. Damien Lisa, a U.S. official says he is expecting a major attack by Iran against Israel as soon as today. The official says the attack could include more than 100 drones, dozens of cruise missiles, and perhaps ballistic missiles as well, and will be aimed at military targets in Israel. General C.Q. Brown is the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. We're really trying to avoid war, and this is part of the, uh, the dialogue uh, that I have with my counterparts within the region, to include the uh, Israeli uh, chief of defense who I talked to yesterday. Um, and we're doing uh, things not only to uh, prevent a war, but at the same time, uh, one of my primary things is to make sure that all of our forces in the region are, uh, are protected. General C.Q. Brown spoke today on CBS Mornings. The House is expected to take up an extension of the expiring portion of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. It is a two-year extension that's now on the table rather than the five-year extension blocked in the House earlier this week. The Biden administration is planning a sweeping effort to block Arctic oil drilling. We get more from Bloomberg's Ed Baxter. A century ago, the U.S. set aside 23 million acres of Alaska's North Slope to serve as an emergency oil supply. Now, President Biden is moving to block any oil and gas development across roughly half of it. The administration says the effort will boost land conservation and fight climate change. The oil industry says the plan is more expansive than initially thought and will make it almost impossible to build another mega project in the region. The companies say they have recently made large discoveries which would yield supplies for decades to come. Ed Baxter, Bloomberg Radio. Finally, round one is wrapping up at the Masters this morning after being suspended last night. Bryson DeChambeau leads at 7-under. Meemaw Tiger Woods has completed 14 and dropped back to even. Global News, 24 hours a day and whenever you want it. With Bloomberg News Now, I'm Michael Barr. This is Bloomberg. Tom, Damian, Lisa. Great dollar peso conversation. Omar, good morning in Guadalajara. Oh. You know, the whole international audience there you here. Go. Uh, That's great. I'm glad we're bringing said, people He in. says you did better than good. Uh, <laughs> Tiger, huh? You, 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 you got bogeyed, the, huh? You got the carry there. Let's talk some golf talk here. I think we've got to. Michael Barr, you said something smart. With rain, Tiger's got to play what? 23, <laughs> 23 holes, right? Yeah. Well, yeah. It, he, when he was suspended because he had completed 13, right. that means today he's got to play 23. Right. It, and that's tough. And he's got to walk it. Right. Yeah. Let's be clear. It's this isn't golf carts and, yeah. and rainbows here. Yeah, it, and it's it, a hilly course. With the torque, Damien, that these pros are working at, what's it do to Tiger Woods or, for, frankly, anybody else's knees? Oh, my knees? God. I, I can't even imagine what his back, his knees, his elbows. I can't even imagine what's going on inside that poor man. But, you know, he still, I mean, look, he's still just one over. I mean, one over. It's unbelievable. He's, you know, is he, is he, like, in the game where if he has a good round today, he's... Well, competing? He, he is going for that. He has to make the cut. The if he record. makes the, the record is 24, right? And he's right. at 23. He's tied for the record. Okay. So all he has to do is make the cut after uh, after what, today? Right. And right. play till the weekend. He's back at even now. Yeah, so, and he's back yeah. at even, not yeah. one over. Sorry, yeah, yeah. even, right. Exactly. Okay, unfair Bloomberg Business Sports question. What's he worth to LIV, <laughs> to live? What would they pay Tiger Woods? He wouldn't go. Because, but they've tried to, to entice him, and we're, we're talking like hundreds of millions of dollars. And uh, but he would not go. Well, I mean, uh, thanks to Ari Agami, our producer, for uh, letting me know, and he's right. I think the number was the high hundred millions when Liv was really going right. for him. Six, seven, it should, yeah, uh, something uh, nuts uh, like that. Shitani money. Okay. <laughs> okay, we've done two rounds of golf talk. We've proven that Lisa Mateo and I have no clue what we're talking about. Futures deteriorate, negative 35 to VIX, 16.30. On YouTube, good morning.
reports, headlines, and breaking news 24 hours a day on Bloomberg Radio, Bloomberg Television, and the Bloomberg Business App. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. From the Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio, I'm Lisa Mateo. Futures pointing to a lower open. Big banks open their books. We'll hit two of them right now. J.P. Morgan Chase are down about 3%. That's after its outlook for full year net interest income missed expectations. And then you have Citigroup. They're up 1%. Its first quarter profit topped estimates. Now we have Nasdaq futures down 8 tenths of a percent. S&P futures down 6 tenths of a percent. Dow futures down about half a percent. The two-year yield at 4.87%. That's down about 8 basis points. The 10-year yield at 4.49 percent that's down about eight basis points as well so news on the ai front we have kathy wood getting in on open ai the founder arc investments management has announced a stake in that chat gpt parent and then you have apple sources saying it's getting ready to overhaul its entire mac computer line with a new set of in-house processors designed to highlight ai and then finally, sources say XAI. They're looking to raise up to $4 billion in a deal that would value Elon Musk startup at $18 billion. That is your Bloomberg Business Flash. Tom and Damien. Lisa, thanks so much. Damien Sassar in for Paul Sweeney. Catherine Greifeld was scheduled to be with us. And it's something to do with Gus the horse. Is that I don't know. You, you know, you were, she was pushed aside by a horse. Keep, so you got to keep your heels we up. We said either Gus the horse or Damien Cesar, which should it be? <laughs> we're here on a really eventful Friday. JP Morgan, I'm with Allison Miller. I'm looking bef- below, uh, you know, I'm looking below the headline data. It, it, Rich, is, is JP Morgan still down like 4% or something? Is it still like, you know, underperformance? Citigroup was up 1, 2%. As well, we'll see. It's, it's sort of a stew, and futures deteriorate negative at 34. The conversation of the day, if not the week, on China. Leland Miller is definitive China Beige Book. He's out of Darden, Charlottesville, absolutely uh, a student of the microdata Kills of China. It. Leland, as simple as I can, thumb up or thumb down on China nominal GDP. Well, I think. Thumbs up, but everything is relative. What are we basing this off of? I'd say, look, things things are going relatively well early in the year, particularly compared to some of the disappointing data last year. But remember, their goal is not to, to rocket GDP skyward. They're not trying to hit some, some high figure. They probably aren't even trying to hit the GDP growth target this year. What they're trying to do is establish some stability, some upward moment, momentum, bring back a little bit of consumer confidence, which have been crushed for the last several years. If they can do that, then this year will be a success, even if they miss the GDP growth target. Leland, dollar yuan sold off this week. It's rallied a bit, but I mean, it's now down 1.7% this year. I think 12.9% since 2021. It's been down in each of the last two years. We have claims of outright fraud at China. Evergrande now, you know, I think uh, China uh, Bank of Communicate, they're trying to go after Shimeo. Uh, you know, talk to us about the property sector. Talk to us about Chinese deflation. What is going on there and how can investors take advantage? Well, first point is pro- uh, deflation. You know, everyone's been talking about Chinese deflation. China is not in broad deflation. Uh, you know, there's there have been uh, you know there there has been a close calls at the end of last year. There is deflationary pressure, uh, but there is not broad deflation in China. You, you're still seeing gains, even though they've been much much slower than everywhere else <laughs> in the world. So, you know, that's a reflection of the fact that Chinese economy hasn't been doing particularly well. So you've got problems there, but you don't yet have this, you know, deflationary way that's being exported out like a lot of people are claiming. You know, property is interesting because it, it was a disaster last year. It's, it's not going to be great anytime soon, but they have stabilized it in the first quarter. And I think the most important thing to take in, uh, into consideration when you're talking about property is this is not a one year, two year, three year battle. This is a decade plus long battle. And what they need to do is essentially make sure that they're, you know, lessening the impact of property as a growth driver. They want to take it down from 25 percent of the economy or so down to much, much lower. But at the same time, not do it so precipitously that they shock the rest of the economy, that they send it into a doom loop of confidence. This is really, really tough to do. So they're being you know, they're tightening, they're tightening, they're tightening credit 
And then, and then when things get bad and cash flow freezes up, contagion is threatened, then they step in and ease conditions a little bit, then they start over. So this is a long cycle and it's a really difficult one. Leland, President Xi hosted you know, business execs out of the US, C-suite executives just last week, trying to entice them, tell them, hey, China's open for business. Then just today, China's telling telco carriers to phase out the use of foreign chips, Intel, AMD. You know, what should we believe here? I mean, is China really open for business from the perspective of a foreign investor? No, of course not. Like, always watch what they do, not what they say. You know, we, we joke about that on the stimulus front. They talk about stimulus every day of the week, but they're not stimulating <laughs> in a big way. You know, so this, you know, it's the same thing applies to foreign investment. 2023 was the year of foreign investment in China. And how did they celebrate right. it? By cracking down on foreign businesses, by shutting down external data sources, by shutting down internal data sources. <laughs> right. You know, this is this is the incoherence that, that, that characterizes China policy these days. You know, Leila, you know, Damien and I, we like to talk, we went to China, we're experts on China. We go to the Mandarin in Hong Kong, we go to the Peace Hotel, in, in Shanghai, you know, sometimes the St. Regis in Beijing, and we say we went deep into China. Leland Miller, what's China's consumer like right now away from the madness of global Wall Street going to three zip codes in mainland China? That's, that's exactly the right way to characterize it. Uh, cyclically, March, the first quarter looked better than it has been for a while. We were seeing retail pick up, services pick up. So cyclically speaking, you know, the, the, the consumer uh, was better off in the first quarter, uh, you know, spent more than they had in a long time. So it's, 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 it's bullish cyclically. But the most important backdrop is always the structural backdrop. Consum there is no consumer wave. There is no consumption push. There is no shift from investment to consumption happening in China because the Chinese economic model disincentivizes households. It disincentivizes consumer spending. So you're not going to see any big time shift. Structurally speaking, China is slowing down massively. There's enormous pressure on consumption. Uh, but look, cyclically speaking, we had, we had a nice month in March and we had a, a, a solid first quarter. Well, we got some pretty weak data on the trade front overnight, but I'm looking ahead to Tuesday of next week, property prices, activity data, retail sales, IP, you get your GDP print. What are you looking for there? What data, what data point is most important to you? Well, most of these things we're ignoring. You know, like the the trade, for instance, you know, the, the numbers are weak, but it's off a pretty high base from last year. Uh, this makes it somewhat difficult. I think the most important thing to to, to keep in mind is how, how are how are retail and services doing? How's the consumption side of the economy doing uh, compared to last year? The answer is it's doing better so far. Has property stabilized? Property has stabilized so far uh, this year. How's manufacturing doing? <clears throat> Manufacturing did well in March. It didn't do well in January, February, but everyone thought it was collapsing last year. And I think we were the only people in the world saying, no, right. it's actually doing fine. And it is doing fine. So the, the economy's up from last year. And I think that's positive. You just right. have to have mild expectations in, ter in terms of where that's going. Leland, thank you so much. Never enough time. We've got to get you on for three hours at some point. The Leland Miller Show. Leland Miller with China Beige Book as well. Mandeep Singh will be with us about an hour from now, maybe 15 minutes from now on Apple. And one of the hearts of the matter here is the gloom over Apple and China. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure I buy it. Well, Tom, you know, I mean, what I wanted to ask Leland about, I mean, ICBC, the largest bank in China, is telling its staff it won't blame them if they extend you know, bad money to developers that are going under. I mean, basically, that's unbelievable. They're just saying, you know, what they're saying is that staff are afraid to loan money to extend credit to, uh, to, to its clients. But it, don't worry about it. We're not going to slap you on the wrist if you, if you happen to lose our money. It's amazing. I mean, it, 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 to me, it's a huge question for like, you know, forget about trading. For the next three years, we could say Mexico seems to be vibrant. You mentioned the carry early. French but China. wither China, 36 months out, is a huge mystery. Yeah, no, I mean, look, I mean, and, and it's been that way for a while. And I, I guess at the end of the day, you know, Leland said it right. You just can't really trust what's coming out yeah. of Beijing these days. Yeah. And, and that goes for the data and it goes for what, yeah. um, what signaling uh, President okay. Xi is sending. Long ago and far away, there was a moment where you first heard Carlos Santana. And you said to yourself, what is he doing? <laughs> and what he did is the, the scale he used is called Dorian. So in the key of C, instead of playing A minor, you play D minor. You go okay. up two step, the first note up, C, D, E, you play D minor. So you say, well, that worked out for Carlos Santana. Who else could that work out for? And I'll never forget the first time 
I heard the song Shannon, Shannon, Shannon out on live chat on YouTube. Thank you so much for mentioning Chris Isaac. I heard this song off a David Lynch movie and I said, this is completely twisted. And it's Chris Isaac in the Dorian mode. It's just great. What a wicked thing to say You never felt this way What a wicked thing to do To make me dream of you And I want to fall in love No, I want to fall in love
months, realistic about those risks and uncertainties, but still, for lots of reasons, very optimistic that we will see inflation uh, come back down and that labor markets will remain healthy. Well, how unconvinced are you that inflation is not going to come down as rapidly as you might have thought? Um, so I do think that we're going to uh, have to be patient, and it may take more time. That is one of my takeaways from some of the data that we've seen. You know, at the same time, the data are mixed, Mike. So yes, the most recent inflation numbers have been elevated compared to what I might have hoped for. But at the same time, if you look at things like wage rates, so wage growth has been faster than it was pre-pandemic. But once you factor in the past price increases and importantly, the productivity gains we've seen, the wage growth that we're seeing is consistent with that trajectory back down to 2% inflation. Um, and I think that's good news for workers as well. But my point is that you need to look at the range of data and not focus too much on, on one piece and take the time to really see uh, what the takeaways should be. Well, you said yesterday that the danger of over-tightening has kind of moved out of the picture at this point. Growth is strong, unemployment remains low, inflation is at least sticky, if nothing else. Why cut rates at all? So I wouldn't say that, the, uh, that there is no risk of us of, you know, uh, waiting too long. I do think that it's uh, two-sided. But to your point, I certainly do see more reason to focus on um, making sure that we don't uh, start easing too quickly. We're resolute. I'm certainly resolute about that commitment to bring inflation back down to 2%. You know, I do see policy as being moderately restrictive at this point, And it, in my view, will be appropriate as we get closer uh, to that trajectory. It will be appropriate to begin easing but we're not there yet. So I don't think that we would indefinitely certainly want to, to stay where we are. Um, I, my baseline would still have us starting to ease later this year, but when I see is likely to be later than I had been previously thinking. I have to ask because everybody's gonna bring up the question is, uh, does the election interfere with timing? Absolutely not. Um, I, you know, the, as I've said a number of times, Focusing holistically on the data is really what determines appropriate policy. And I have to say, there's enough of that to keep us very busy. So uh, that is my focus, and that's the focus of the committee. You mentioned policy is moderately restrictive. What tells you that? And how do you know what level of restrictiveness you need? So uh, in terms of the last piece, that's where watching the data comes from. Are we seeing the balance of performance that we're looking for over time? Um, you know, certainly there's evidence of some restriction. Uh, we've seen housing market reactions. We've seen um, some increase in delinquencies. We've seen some declines in uh, capital spending. And so there clearly is evidence in a variety of places. Labor markets are coming into better balance, and that's a really important one. At the same time, consumption and demand have remained uh, perhaps surprisingly strong given uh, where interest rates are and what we might have thought based on history. But, you know, we've seen in a lot of contexts the ways that the current context is somewhat different. So I would characterize where we are as policy is having a restrictive effect, which is what we want, but it's perhaps moderately restrictive and that calls again for patience and being methodical as we look at all of the data. We've now got uh, pricing basically for a December <laughs> rate cut uh, as markets move back and forth. But my nerdy economist friends have spent the last two days putting PPI and CPI into the PCE calculations. And everybody is saying PCE is going to come in much milder than both of those. If that's the case, can we say June might be back on the table? So I don't want to speculate again, you know, not a preset path. And I think we have to wait to see what the data tell us. Um, but to my earlier point, the data have been mixed, and CPI and PCE don't always move in lockstep. They certainly are you know, very closely related. And so I think we have to wait and let the data tell us uh, what's happening. And again, um, it's not just the PCE, although that is certainly the preferred measure that we, uh, that we are focusing on when we look at our 2% target. 
It's all of it and how it comes together collectively. So wage data will be important. Um, when I look at the price data, I also want to disaggregate and look at what's happening to the different components because the dynamics there are different and that's informative for trying to understand uh, where we might be going. Not just where we've been, the key question is where are we going and uh, what's that outlook like? and uh, trying to get to greater confidence before we change the policy stance. Uh, former St. Louis Fed President Jim Bullard once said uh, during the aftermath of the financial crisis, whatever you think the right rate for the country is, this isn't it. Uh, are you anxious to cut? Do you want to cut? Do we need a cut? Or can we live with rates at this level? Well, in the, you know, in the near term, I don't see urgency. Um, I had uh, been a bit concerned earlier uh, in the year, very early in the year, that there might be some signs of labor market fragility. Um, I'm seeing much less reason for concern, but that again is why I see the risks as being two-sided. So I don't see urgency and I see lots of reasons for patience. And over the longer term, I think we'll, uh, my expectation is that we will ease and that over the longer term inflation uh, interest rates will be at lower levels. But exactly what uh, that looks like, it's really premature to be too, too specific. The data may be mixed, but what are CEOs in your district saying about both uh, employment, growth, and also about whether or not they're still having to raise salaries and whether they're going to have to raise prices? So, uh, and we do have many conversations with um, people throughout our district, large firms, small firms, um, throughout New England. And what I'm hearing is a couple of things. One is quite a bit of optimism in terms of the economy's performance overall. Um, I'm hearing uh, information consistent with labor markets really coming into better balance, being easier to hire, except in a couple of sectors like healthcare, where that can still be quite a challenge. Um, so, you know, it's, uh, there are differences across different sectors and localities, um, but that uh, firms have not been expecting the same kinds of wage increases that they had needed before to retain workers, quit rates are way down, um, much less turnover. And, and that helps with productivity, right? Because if you are focused continually on having to fill those gaps because people are leaving and then you have to train people to come up to speed, it's hard to maintain that productivity that firms really need. And that's part of the good productivity story that we've seen that has helped with economic growth and helped us to bring inflation down uh, as much as we did in 2023, despite the fact that um, growth has been continue to be so robust. So there's a strong supply side story there as well. Well, productivity is one half of potential growth, and you're talking about productivity being good. A lot of argument these days that we're seeing more immigration than we're really accounting for, and that uh, basically potential growth is higher than we thought it was. Do you agree with that? So I certainly have seen increases in labor supply as being a key part of that um, supply improvement story that has certainly benefited the economy. Um, and the labor supply increases have uh, included immigration, uh, and there's been a lot of work um, which has, uh, you know, come from different uh, people finding similar stories in terms of the increase in immigration playing a role. But we've also seen an increase in labor force participation, uh, particularly in prime age workers that was not anticipated, and really notably among prime age women, even though we know that the Childcare challenges continue, and those are really quite stark. So there have been some surprising uh, supply improvement news, and uh, we'll have to see the extent to which those continue, but it's certainly been an important part of the story so far. One last uh, question for our Money Market Desk friends. <laughs> that is, you had a staff briefing and a discussion of whether or not and when to taper uh, quantitative tightening. Uh, the agreement, apparently, according to the minutes, was that you should announce it fairly soon. Can we expect something like that at the June meeting? So no decisions were made. The um, minutes uh, talk uh, summarize the discussion that we had, and it really draws from lessons from the past period of quantitative tightening from 2017 to 2019. And some of the key lessons from that experience are uh, the importance of doing the um, 
you know, the tightening, in other words, runoff of the balance sheet in a way that is smooth and does not cause stresses. You know, that proverbial, should be like watching paint dry, right? It shouldn't be uh, unexpected. And so the, uh, uh, there was broad agreement that slowing the pace, which is currently about twice as fast as it had been in that earlier period, um, and doing so sooner to ensure that it continues to be quiet and orderly and passive in the backgrounds, broad agreement for that, and also to start that uh, sooner. But no specific decisions have been made yet. So we could get taper before we get a rate cut. Um, th those things are, I see them as being independent. So uh, that could happen. Susan Collins, thank you very much for joining us today here at Bloomberg on Bloomberg Radio and Television Worldwide. We'll send it back to you. Michael McKee, thank you so much with a gentle lady from the Boston uh, Fed. There are many economic headlines. It's something to look at, but Damien Sassauer and I here in our studios with Michael Barr looking at the news from the Levant, there's just no other way to put it. Geopolitics front and center. You look at equities, bonds, currencies, in oil, and oil has a different story. J Damien, let me do the exact data while you look at your screen. Please. West Texas Intermediate up 2.4%. I have an 87 on American oil Brent crude. 91.58 up $1.85 up 2.1% as well. Gold up $41, 1.7%. 2413 geopolitics damien sass our front and center yeah you know it's so great that you get real-time pricing i mean they don't I, I don't afford that they don't give me real-time pricing i'm a little delayed here but these numbers i mean it looks like at 8 a.m s p e minis just rolled over and now if you look at bond yields they're falling as well here this is the first time we i think we're 10 years back below 450 here so uh and currencies versus the dollar just about every single one of them is in the red so dollar right. stronger i'm working off two-year yield here we had a five percent watch there for a cup of coffee cup of sanka mm. i should say we've come in 12 <laughs> basis points from a five uh, level the two-year yield 4.88 percent and i'm sorry there's a dollar resiliency here yes. damien those weak dollar having a painful friday there's a few out there hong kong dollar but that's a dollar peg actually your friends in indonesia the rupee seems to be up but that's probably because it's not trading so yeah it looks like it's red across the board here in currency land relative <clears throat> to the dollar yeah, and 152.79. We'll have further data checks for you and Lisa Mateo with the, the flash as well. Lisa, what do you see? Yeah, deteriorating fast. We have NASDAQ futures down nearly a percent right now. Dow and S&P futures down about seven-tenths of a percent. We'll head over to the two-year yield at 4.88 percent. That's down about seven basis points. The 10-year yield at 4.51 percent. That's down about eight basis points as well. We have a few things. We have Israel bracing for possible attacks from Iran. We have investors studying earnings from some of Wall Street's biggest banks. Let's check in with a few of those now. We have JP Morgan down more than 3%, Wells Fargo down more than 1%, and Citibank, they're up about half a percent right now. Have to go to commodities. You have Spot Gold, well, Comex Gold at 2,413 an ounce, Spot Gold at 2,396 an ounce, and oil, Brent crude $91 a barrel, NYMEX crude $86 a barrel. We'll take you over to tech right now. We have Intel and AMD. They're both down 2% right now. This is after that report from the Wall Street Journal. China telling its telecom carriers to phase out foreign chips by 2027. That is your Bloomberg Business Flash. Tom and Damien. Lisa, thanks so much. Sterling, a 124 and a 124.60. Uh, Bloomberg Surveillance brought to you by Interactive Brokers. Discover the future of trading with our next generation trading platforms. IBKR Desktop. IBKR Desktop, download the IBKR desktop at IBKR.com slash desktop. Perfect guest right now for this turmoil of geopolitics into a Friday of what to do with your account with a lot of experience. Thomas Martin joins us, Senior Portfolio Manager, Global T Investments, on the equity outlook here I haven't asked this question in, in quite some days here, and I, I think Damien had it earlier, uh, Thomas Martin, where cash is there, money market funds seem to be back, back, back in vogue. Is cash a comfortable place to be given global turmoil? Well, cash, um, thanks for having me on the show. And uh, cash is definitely um, a place to be for global turmoil. It's really the only thing that has 
sort of a no correlation um, with any of the markets, whether it's stocks or bonds or, or what have you. So if you really want to have some safety, cash is the place to be. And of course, now you're getting a return on that. So it's uh, it's definitely positive to have that. Um, you know, with the equity markets having performed as well as they have so far, uh, you know, there's there's reason to have a little bit of dry powder. I look, Damien, at the dry powder question and somehow is oil launches, I mean, gold up forty one dollars. You know, I'm going to get a 92 print on Brent crude and it's going to be a new definition of dry powder. Yeah, I mean, I got to believe that, you know, Mr. Martin, when he's talking with his clients, is talking about capital preservation in this environment. They are talking about cash, but cash takes different forms, Tom. Uh, so, Mr. Martin, I wonder if you could just, you know, educate me. You know, when you're talking to your clients and you're talking about cash and you're talking about getting defensive and protecting what you have there, how do you do it? Um, well, a couple of ways. Uh, one is, in fact, just cash, cash. And, you know, there's really no substitute for 90 day T bills for real cash. You can start going out a little bit on the maturity scale. But once you start getting to a year or so, uh, you know, you start taking a little bit more risk. Um, but certainly the short end of the curve, two years or less, um, is a place that could be considered cash like. Uh, you know, until, you know, rates start going up. And we've we've seen that um, in the last little bit here is that even two year rates uh, have gone up. And so you sort of right. lose money there, whereas you don't lose it in cash. You know, another place where we um, have been defensive is, is in gold. Uh, and, you know, that defensive posture um, comes from a lot of sources. I mean, what's mm -hmm. it defensive against? Uh, certainly, everybody knows that inflation is, is one of those things. Uh, and then, of course, right. the geopolitical turmoil is another one. Uh, um, so we have a substantial position there, uh, too. Thomas Martin with us here with Gold as well. Markets on the move. Damien, moments ago, DXY, the blended major trading indice, mm -hmm. pops through a 106, 103. 104, a cup of sank at 105, <laughs> and now stronger dollar 106. Well, you know what's interesting? I mean, and we, we were just talking about cash. We're talking about cash surrogates. I'm an EM guy, and one thing that has been just a risk on trade is this carry trade. We talk about this. So, in, in a flight to quality type of environment, one would think that those carry trades get unwound. And so, trades that we like to look at, Tom, and, you know, Mr. Martin, I'd love to have your opinion on this. You know, looking at, for example, dollar rail, you know, risk reversals, or I'm just basically getting short Mexico versus the dollar here, you know, and talk to us a little bit about that. Are there trades that are a little bit more uh, cyclical in nature, a little bit more high beta that we can get into from a defensive posturing perspective? Well, there's the, you know, one way to do it is to go for the things that have underperformed and particularly in value oriented stocks Euro and just the things that are unrecognized. Um, that's the place to go. But as the markets tried to do that, it hasn't panned out very well. And yesterday was just sort of a poster child for that, um, is that the Dow and value indices did very poorly versus the growth and momentum yep. which came back. Now, that may be reversing a little bit today. Um, but it's it's tough to get defensive in those kinds of names. Mr. Martin, one last question I have for you is about credit spreads. I mean, let's just be frank here. USIG and high yield spreads are up 7 and 11 percent respectively on the year. I mean, talk to us a little bit. I'm sorry, down. Talk to us a little bit about the spread compression. I mean, how do we reconcile that? I mean, is that going to last? And, you know, where do we go from here in credit markets? Yeah, we have not been in favor of having any credit in our portfolio. We've been strictly uh, long on, well, not long in the duration, but uh, in treasuries. And we don't think that you're getting paid to take the risk of having mm -hmm. um, credit at those spreads. And especially as they continue to compress that, that reach for yield is you're not having to reach very far. Um, so if we're going to take that kind of risk, we'd rather be in equities. Thomas Martin, thank you so much for joining us with Gobalt uh, today. On Apple CarPlay on YouTube, search Bloomberg Podcast. There's a live chat out there. Shannon driving the bus today on the, <coughs> the live chat with some others as well. Real international conversation. And these are international markets. I mean, this is not about, oh, JP Morgan, they missed this or they missed that. 
I've got oil moving 2.2% yep. on Brent crude yeah, right now. Above I mean, I'm not to a 92 print, but I'm getting there. Getting there. I'm getting there rapidly, Damien. I mean, look, you know, for me, when you look at Brent crude, you can't look at front month. You got to look at the one year calendar spread. And we are probably pushing now above 10% backwardation. What that means is that if you look at today's front month crude price and at one year from now, we are completely flipped into backwardation. That means, uh, you know, basically what it means is that you're seeing the front month rip oh, to the and one element of the geopolitical risk is well and i got copper with a two-day pop i'm well out to over two standard deviations on copper excess supply no going demand. back to february and again these are some of the trends folks that get us away from what's apple doing what's nvidia doing yeah. and that futures negative 42 the vix was out two big figures right now uh damien 16.85 on a vix look at equities here wow yeah everything Everything is basically coming out of bed. And look, I mean, I, I, I take your point. If you look at some of these other commodities, too, if you look at LME Copper, if you're looking at iron ore, you know, they're, I mean, LME Copper is down, too. I mean, so this is kind of a broad-based sell-off, and, you know, I can only imagine what yields are going to do by the end of today. Well, by the end of the day, we're going to have to see, and I would say the end of today, with Carol Masser, I should say. She's like the whole She's end the of the day thing, I Carol Masser. I, yeah. I have no idea what you're going to hear from Carol Masser on Apple CarPlay and YouTube uh, today. Let me do the commodity complex again, which does speak to the tensions. Ethan Bronner leading our coverage in Israel uh, as we look over to Persia and some real talk here about what Iran will do in response uh, to what we saw days ago from uh, Israel. Western uh, Texas Intermediate, West Texas Intermediate, $87 a barrel, up $2.22. Brent crude up $2. $91.69 on Brent crude. I would suggest a 92 print is a big deal. Gold now with a bid further, 1.8%, up $42. Thank you, Dennis Gartman. And I, I don't even want to look at the chart. Damien Sassauer, gold in yen. Oh, my goodness. It's like beyond cocoa. Oh, yeah. No, that's been a huge trade. And you know what I'm actually going to be interested to see here is how Apple kind of performs here. Because, you know, Apple has basically for the first time been talking about artificial intelligence. The whole world's been waiting for this. I mean, you would think on a normal trading day that Apple shares would be ripping. But with all that's going on right here, Tom, it'll be interesting to see how right. that stock responds. Rich, when do we have Mandeep? Do we have Mandeep in five minutes or does this... Oh, yes, people said he can't make it in 20 five minutes. minutes. So we've made deep singing 15 uh, minutes ago. I mean, I mean, Apple went three standard deviations yesterday from like minus 1.5. It's cheap, up Tom. Up to plus 1.5. <laughs> it was a moonshot through moving averages of this bear market we've seen in Apple since the end of December. I yeah. mean, it was, it was a shift. Yeah, no, this is this is a flight to quality move. You know, I'm happy we get to share this moment together on a sleepy Friday, Tom. I mean, this is everything to do with the Middle East tension with Iran. And look, I mean, right now on the tape, I mean, Israel's basically planning at some point over the next few days uh, for Iran to invade or, or do something. So yeah, they're they're they're, they're preparing. A single item I'm watching, folks. Brent crude, ninety one seventy an ounce. We're gonna get out front of a very strong half hour. We're gonna get the markets open. That'll be important here with futures at uh, negative 43. Mandeep Singh will join us here on the technological future of Apple Computer. And before that, Christopher Whalen on the linkage of commercial real estate to our banking system. From New York City, Bloomberg Surveillance.
markets, headlines, and breaking news 24 hours a day on Bloomberg Radio, Bloomberg Television, and the Bloomberg Business App. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. From the Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio, I'm Lisa Mateo alongside Tom Keen and Damian Sassauer with your opening bell report. Now, we've had a lot going on before the bell. We had big bank earnings. We also learned import prices. They rose about a fourth of a fourth of 0.4% in March. That was a rise in fuel prices, drove that headline figure. But when you take that out of the picture, import prices were pretty much flat. You also have Israel bracing for a possible attack from Iran. What does all this mean for the markets? Let's get to it right now. We'll start with the S&P 500 down about seven tenths of a percent. The Dow down half a percent. The Nasdaq down nearly one percent. We go over to the two-year yield at 4.89 percent. Uh, and that is down about seven basis points. The 10-year yield at 4.5 percent. And that is down about eight basis points as well. To commodities, I have to talk about oil. Uh, we have NYMEX crude at $87 a barrel, Brent crude $91 a barrel. Uh, we also have silver hit the highest in more than three years. Have to mention that copper rising to its highest level since June of 2022. And at the open, of course, we want to talk about banks. We have JP Morgan, they're down 3%. And Wells Fargo, they're down about nearly 2%. That is your Bloomberg opening bell report. Tom and Damien. Uh, Lisa Mateo, thanks so much. On Apple CarPlay, tune in right now. Bloomberg Business app, it's free. There's no charge. You get a fancy car like Damien, <laughs> like Paul Sweeney. You get Apple CarPlay. On YouTube right now, this is a demand list. Listen on YouTube, search Bloomberg Podcast. Huge, huge audience this week. Thank you so much for the global audience, including many people from Montevideo. I can't spell it, but it's down there. It's near Buenos Aires. It's it's somewhere. Uruguay. It's like Uruguay. God, Uruguay. God, Uruguay. Is that how you say it? Uruguay, yeah. It's like God's country. Montevideo. You know? This is really important. I'll put out a tweet, and there'll be like some announcement. I'll go dot, 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 anticipated. This is the anticipated book of the fall. Christopher Whalen and his staff are knee deep in through the summer rewrites of his classic inflated How Money and Debt Built the American Dream First Edition. We're going to give you a front run on the second edition right now. Your book's got to be radically different given the debt and deficit mess we're in right now. Oh, certainly, Tom, and thank you for that wonderful plug. Uh, the last two chapters have to be rewritten. Uh, in the past, we were more worried about the dollar. Does the election matter to you? No, not in the grand scheme of things. I think it's we're, we're nearing the end of the progressive wave of the past century, which was largely driven by my ancestors. So it's and FDR's their fault, right? No, it's just that when a society takes on too much, eventually the demographics tell you what's going to happen. And we have fewer and fewer workers and more and more old people. So we're going to be consuming capital. You know, Bob Duggar, the retired partner at Tudor, wrote a great piece about the coming drought of savings in International Economy magazine. And that's that's yeah. what's going to drive policy. Bob Duggar is one of the most original out front thinkers I've known in the act for years. Yeah, He's definitely. like really twisted and different. Damien, dive in. Well, here Tom, I, I mean, I appreciate you plug. I'm, I'm going to plug another book. I'm going to take you back to 2014, Chris Whalen. Let's talk about you know, financial stability, fraud, confidence in the wealth of the nations, <laughs> your book back then. Let's think about the lessons learned from the last global financial crisis and now what we're seeing today with these markets. I mean, how should investors be looking? What, more importantly, what indicators should they be looking at to say, you know, hey, things aren't right here. Things don't smell good. Well, the way I look at banks, you know, we published some bank indices earlier this year and we weighted quality versus size. Now, you can't ignore size, but my attitude is if you want to be safe with banks, you want to own the top 25 out of the top 100. So that's a pretty harsh cut. You're basically saying you want to avoid two thirds of them or yeah, three the quarters of them. Damien, right. uh, JP Morgan, 196 down to 188. Oh, right. well, let's just talk about that, Chris. Let's, let's unpack that a bit. You're talking about owning from an investor standpoint, Correct. right? You're not talking about keeping your deposits with banks. No, but whether you care about income yeah. or alpha, yeah. you want to know where the good ones are. And so, for example, we just wrote a, a piece about uh, Bank OZK, George Gleason. Well, George is a little bank, but he <laughs> produces a lot of construction and development loans. People make the mistake of thinking he's in commercial real estate lending. He's not. He lends in the beginning of the life cycle of the asset, then he gets out. Very smart. So talk to us about the big bank, little bank. You know, talk to us about that dynamic. You know, I mean, is that not going away soon? Do you see that wedge, that divergence in the performance between big and small banks continuing? Well, in terms of financial performance, the smaller banks do better. Yeah. They have more pricing power. Mm -hmm. They tend to have much more operating leverage, too. 
much lower efficiency ratios. And this is why Jamie Dimon is so remarkable. Since he bought uh, First Republic, his efficiency ratio has been in the mid-50s, which is painful for everyone else because they're in the 60s, low 70s. If you want to well, compete with Jamie, you've got to have a five-handle on it, efficiency. Folks, inflated is a twisted book. I mean, <laughs> I mean chapter to chapter to chapter. It's, it, the only one I know that comes close to you is Mariano Mozzicato, who's doing a Marxist thing over in England. And, and Mazzucato and you go chapter to chapter and say, hey, you can't understand Bloomberg's surveillance unless you know your history. Yes. Are we heading towards the fifth national bank of the United States in a combo of J.P. Morgan and Bank of America? I, I think America's headed to a large restructuring that is very similar to the 1930s when the Reconstruction Finance Corp essentially re, right. re, restructured yeah. everything that wasn't solvent. Right. I got to shift gears here, Damien. I want you to climb on board this insight. Mm -hmm. CRE, and Wayland's led the discussion on this, mm -hmm. is different now because we have Twitter. So you're at home or whatever, you're out on the road, I'm walking vet bill, mm -hmm. and I got Twitter up, and it's one guy with a genius walkthrough of how something that was 100 million is now 18 million yeah. in real estate. Right. I mean, yeah. social media, Damien, has changed the CRE debacle. No, I agree with that. And look, I mean, there's been a lot of talk about the death of CRE and CLOs and other securitized products for that yes. matter in this environment. And so, you know, just to move away from that, I really just want to kind of focus more on this concept of the big banks and how, you know, the big 20 and those are the ones you want to focus on. That's still 20 banks, right? And yes. there's a big difference between Citigroup and J.P. Morgan. So yeah, help educate you. Like, what are you looking for? How do you differentiate between those big banks in terms of um, making an investment cape one way or the other? Well, you know, I've been doing this for a while. We've been building bank analytics for 30 years. And over time, you decide what's important. So equity returns, total um, market return, <clears throat> operating leverage, price to book. All of those things tell you kind of sort of the same thing, but from a different perspective. You know, for example, George has got one of the best performing banks in the country at Bank OZK, but he's still trading around book. Yeah. American yeah. Express is five times book. Okay? Yeah. Very different right. franchises. Let me give you a market update here, Damien. Get ready for another question with Christopher Whalen. Yes, We're down two eleven on the Dow, negative thirty-two. Mm -hmm. uh, pretty much lows here with the market open, fifty-one sixty-seven SPX. We are moments away from ninety-two Brent. We're not there yet. Ninety-one eighty-four just made a dash, didn't get there. 87 and change on NYMEX, gold 2416 and that's, this sounds like a data check yeah. from 20 years ago. You know, when you look at banks though, I mean, just going back, I mean, you look at an interest rate sensitive sector, right? And so, you know, I guess for me, you know, if I'm believing all this Kool-Aid that's going on in the market right now and I want to get defensive, you know, Chris, walk me through how do you think about protecting investor assets in this market? Is it gold? Is it cash? Is it money markets? Is it something else? Well, I would be very careful with financials because we're still coming out of the COVID period when we had zero interest rates. This both helped and hurt. It caused problems and it also solved problems. Yeah. But going forward, you know, everyone was fixated on net interest margin. Right. You guys had a piece on the Bloomberg this morning. No, it's about spreads. And guess what? Net totally interest agree. margin is going to totally be flat agree. rest of the year. What's so important, folks, of Bloomberg surveillance worldwide, what you just heard from Mr. Whalen is a completely different world from Gina Martin Adams, and yet they came to the same conclusion <laughs> on financials. That's really important. Two twisted, ornery, different views, <laughs> and the same conclusion is be careful out there. Yeah, and dividend yields are now, I mean, earning yields are now far less than fixed the yields you can get in fixed right. income, right? So, I mean, you know, it, it's got that mountain to climb also if we go into sort of a risk-off environment. You know, last question, Chris. I mean, talk to us a little bit about, you know, when you do look at equities and you take a step back, how do you approach that? Are you looking at big versus small caps? Are you looking at tech versus other sectors? I mean, we talk about the banking sector, but what else is out there? Well, look, half of my book is either preferred or debt. The other half is equity. I rode NVIDIA up. I kept <laughs> stepping off because it was too big. It was a third of my portfolio at one point. Um, and finally, I got out a couple months ago. Uh, so there are opportunities. I own Chevron. I own some other things. But in terms of the banks, I own U.S. Bank, Common, and Wells. That's it. Everything else is a preferred. So if you want exposure to financials, look at the preferreds because there's a lot less volatility. Dan, Daniel Paris with a real con controversial book out who says we got to get back to the time we remember where dividends mattered. Yes. Are stock buybacks a dividend equivalent, Chris Whalen? No, no, it's a, it's a Why? different thing. Why? Discuss that. 
stock buybacks are basically about feeding the street. It's kind of the vig you have to pay to the guy on the corner, you know, who works for Blackstone or, you know, whatever. So to me, dividends right. are a more honest way to return cash to shareholders because I don't have to pay a fee. Right. You know? we're yeah, we're trying to get you here with 92 a barrel to create some drama. <laughs> 91. Look, I'm with you, Tom. Come on, give me the tick, guys. I triple need a, digits. But I, I, need, I need a nut. Are, are you predicting triple digit oil? Uh, when that missile flies and hits uh, real estate in Israel. Yes. Look, the world is at war. We never talk about this. The world is in a low intensity conflict that's about to get hotter. Yeah. Yeah. And Don't, that's why Jamie Dimon, by the way, is talking about geopolitical when everybody else right. wants to talk about NIM. I mean, be about, think about yeah. what Chris is saying here. Since the October 7th invasion, right, and Hamas, right. spreads are tighter, oil well, is relatively, uh, maybe a little bit higher now, yeah. right. but, re but really the dollar's yeah. weaker. Damon, I mean, we're we staying the script, Damon. We gotta go to the news here. There's a lot of news out <laughs> there. Chris Whalen, I know you're in from Montevideo. Don't be a stranger. Chris Whalen, <laughs> with a book out Columbus this circle. fall that will be must, must read. With our news in New York City, Michael Barr. Thank you very much, Tom, Damien, and Lisa. Israel is bracing for a possible attack from Iran, either directly or via its proxies, with drones and missiles on government targets within days. That's according to people familiar with Western intelligence assessments. The move has the potential to trigger an all-out regional war. Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General C.Q. Brown Jr. said that he is talking with counterparts in the region to try to prevent that from happening, while at the same time implementing measures to make sure U.S. forces in the region are protected. We're always planning and preparing. That's one thing we do very well is plan and prepare. General C.Q. Brown Jr. spoke on CBS Mornings. Sources tell Bloomberg an assault is expected to come as soon as the next 48 hours. One scenario is an attack on Israel from Iranian soil, which would be unprecedented. In Washington, the House of Representatives is set to vote today on reauthorizing a key part of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. The FISA law allows U.S. intelligence agencies to spy on the communications of foreign nationals without a warrant. FBI Director Chris Wray warns of dire consequences if it's not renewed. Section 702 is indispensable in keeping Americans safe from a whole barrage of fast-moving foreign threats. It is crucial to identifying terrorists in the homeland, working with or inspired by a rogues gallery of foreign terrorist organizations who have publicly called for attacks against our country. Ray says the law cannot be allowed to lapse, describing perhaps the most dangerous threat environment here at home since 9-11. Round one is wrapping up at the Masters. Bryson DeChambeau leads at 7-under and will tee off a round for the round two at just before noon. Now, Tiger Woods just finished up after his play was suspended last night. He played the first 18 at one over. And we'll start round two in just over a half hour. Global News, 24 hours a day and whenever you want it with the Bloomberg News Now. I'm Michael Barr. This is Bloomberg. Tom, Damien. Uh, Michael Barr, thanks so much. We've got to go back to markets here. I want to talk sports, but we're not going to do it right now. Negative <laughs> 212 on the Dow, 38,246. Uh, futures were negative 25 up to negative 16. We're now open with the SPX negative 32. NASDAQ down a stick. Uh, we're out two big figures on VIX. We're at 16 points. 72. Damien, what do you see in the foreign exchange space? Well, I'm just looking at the U.S. 10-year also. We're back above 450, but in FX, it's a sea of red here. I mean, it's just red across the board. Dollars up versus nearly every currency on the planet. And that makes sense, right? I mean, look, this is the dollar smile we talk about. You know, there's dollar exceptionalism. Growth is great. Dollar's going to rally. And then right. flight to quality, dollar's going to rally. Moments ago, Brent crude, $92.09 a barrel. We're out to up 2.62%. Look to Will Kennedy and our hydrocarbons team from London for further uh, news on oil through the weekend. On Apple CarPlay, on YouTube, search Bloomberg Podcast. There's a live, live chat. Good morning.
markets, headlines, and breaking news 24 hours a day on Bloomberg Radio, Bloomberg Television, and the Bloomberg Business App. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. From the Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio, I'm Lisa Mateo. We've got red on the screen on this kickoff to earnings season. Right now, the Nasdaq down seven tenths of a percent. The Dow and S&P 500 down about half a percent. The two-year yield at 4.89 percent. That's down about seven basis points. The 10-year yield at 4.50 percent, and that's down about eight basis points as well. I want to check in with a few more big banks that we've been hearing from this morning. As far as Citibank, right now uh, they're up about one percent. We have BlackRock down just a fraction. State Street up about seven tenths of a percent. Over to tech, we have Intel and AMD. Intel right now down nearly four percent. AMD is down more than four and a half percent. And this is after the report from the Wall Street Journal, China telling its telecom carriers to phase out foreign chips by 2027. That is your Bloomberg Business Flash. Tom and Damien. Lisa Mateo, thanks so much. We'll continue to follow these markets. $92 print on Brent, $91.94 right now. Something changed yesterday. We're going to parachute in. Damien Cesar and Tom Keen, Mandeep Singh here, that something changed. It was a jump condition in a ginormous stock. Yeah. Mandeep Singh, what does it take to make Apple Computer go up 4%? Well, so I think uh, for the pretty much four months of this year, you have been hearing how Apple has been behind, uh, you know, AI and really they haven't done uh, as much as Microsoft and other companies, Google and, uh, you know, uh, OpenAI have done on the right. uh, Gen AI side. So that's where the chip really makes a difference because Apple's value proposition has always been the vertical integration. The fact that they give you the seamless experience across operating system, the chip they have, and right. the app system uh, that's built. So I think the fact that they announced a new chip, most likely it will have on-device AI features, and that's what got right. everyone excited yeah, because Mandy, that was a bear case. I get uh -huh. it. Afterthought needs AI to get through, you know, physics in, in, in junior year. Yeah. Fine. Do I need AI on my next Apple toy? Absolutely. I mean, look, uh, uh, the features are proven at this point of time. Think of, you know, Siri. Right now, you don't use Siri at all. Yes. But if you start applying on-device AI and what it can do for you, Siri is a huge uh, function that Apple has, and they can enhance it with AI features. The autocomplete feature you see in your messages, I mean, that can be enhanced so much with AI. The, the camera, I mean, yes, Apple has a great camera, but if it incorporates AI features, it will make it even more powerful it'll and make, sticky. It, it'll so, even make me look good, yeah, exactly. Damien. How about that? You know, Mandeep, I really need to ask you about some of this word, this, this talk out of China that's telling its telco characters to start phasing out chips from Intel and AMD. Talk to us a little bit about the impact on those two companies. Well, so I think from our perspective, we are modeling that all the chip companies will lose their China business over the course of wow. the next five to 10 years. And the fact that, right. you know, the Chinese uh, have given a date around phasing these out, probably it's going to happen earlier than what everyone expected. Everyone was thinking it's going to be a 10 years phase out. This looks like more of a three year phase out. And so that's why, you know, Nvidia we know has suffered because they can't sell to China. Well, now Intel and AMD that had a business in China, they will probably lose it. And guess what? Even Nvidia will have a very tough time selling their chips to China because clearly the mandate is very clear for them that you know they want to use domestically manufactured chips. And, and, and what about Taiwan Semiconductor? So Taiwan Semi, I think, is in a still in a much better spot simply because, I mean, you take aside the geopolitical aspect that China can invade Taiwan. Other than that, Taiwan Semi is still the go-to place for every device maker, every fabulous uh, chip design company, because they are the only game in town in terms of manufacturing advanced nodes. And I don't think anyone else is even close to them. So they probably have a better shot in terms of, you know, allocating that Sending capacity walls, to someone yeah. else. Because, yeah. Okay, now for the sensitive question of the day. We leave this for 9.50 a.m. Wall Street time, down negative uh -huh. 183. The tape a little bit better. 92 Brent crude is now 91.67. They're going to build semiconductor factories in America, Mandeep Singh. 
Samsung in Arizona, Taiwan this, dot, dot, dot. Can American workers build three nanometer semiconductors? I, I think uh, given such a big government push, I am ready to bet they will. It's just that it's going to be, uh, you know, a big toll in terms of what it would take to uh, do that. And I would uh, bet my money on TSMC actually being one of the first companies right. to do that well, because they have all the incentive. I mean, Apple, Nvidia, all these companies are the biggest customers. Right. Yeah. But so come on, they in have chip, to please. But Mandy, in Chip yeah. War, my book of the summer, Chip War, Chris Miller, I, I can't say enough about the book. Morris Chang doesn't mince words. He wants the yeah. labor intensity of Taiwan and all the processes that made Morris Cheng iconic. Can he get those same labor processes in labor intensity out of American workers? I mean, it will come at a higher cost. So clearly uh, your costs for chips are going up and that probably means better gross margins because TSMC has that pricing power to pass those costs on to their customers. So I, I do think it will, the cost will go up and uh, a TSMC still has the pricing power, but uh, I would bet, you know, uh, coupled with the immigration policy and other changes around training the workers, it, it will happen. It, it's just it will take time and it will come at a higher price. You know, Mandeep, I mean, now that we're past the CPI and we're past payrolls for the month of April, I mean, I just need to ask you, you know, this is all about earnings. Earnings season is has begun. It begins today. You know, we're still a couple weeks out before, you know, the, the big tech companies start reporting. But, you know, take us through what you're thinking today. You know, which company is it Microsoft, Apple, NVIDIA? You know, who are you focused the most on, you know, as we head into uh, into this next earnings season? Yeah, look, Microsoft clearly looks the most robust and resilient out of the big tech in terms of, you know, their top line growth. They clearly have a lot of uh, things going for them. The other ones, I mean, Apple, we know their China business is going to hurt and uh, they just found it hard to grow their top line. For uh, Google and Meta, clearly, you know, they've got the AI act together and the fact that they have their own large oh, language on, model on. helps them. Mandy, look, Mandy, I mean... Mandy, you have to go, uh, yeah. You're on Bloomberg surveillance. You're supposed to say Google has YouTube. Okay, continue. Tom, Microsoft has a $3.2 trillion market cap. That's larger than France's GDP. I mean, you know, and, and yeah, here we are, and we're focused on it, and there's reason for it to go higher. Is there not, Mandy? Yes, I, I think so. They have the most recurring uh, earnings revenue stream, and they're the best position in AI. I mean, everyone else has somewhat of, uh, you know, a disruptive element to their business. Right. Yes, Alphabet has caught up, but their search business can still be disrupted by all the AI, you know, innovation that's going on. Mandy. And in the case of Meta, they are hugely exposed to advertising. So Microsoft does have all the bases covered from that perspective. Out of time on short notice, Mandeep Singh here off Mark Gurman's brilliant work on Apple yesterday. I can't say enough how Gurman owns the path forward for Apple and people, everybody within the tech community uh, reading Bloomberg News is Mark uh, Gurman. Shout out also to Lucas Shaw out in Hollywood writing a brilliant Paul Sweeney. Love like Lucas. Essay, I love know. Lucas. Your Lucas is just like, a lot. Damien, what's your takeaway here on geopolitical tension? Is that an opportunity? Um, I think it always is, but I mean, I wouldn't be jumping all over it given where valuations are. You know, what I really wanted to ask Mandeep, and I know he didn't see this, but I see this because I don't know if you follow what's going on in China with this AI mogul's wife who admitted to $21 million of secret trades. I mean, basically the number one AI entrepreneur in China, his wife was, uh, I guess, front running and doing a little bit of insider trading at yeah. the margin. And uh, I guess the government found out and that's not good. Well, it's going to be an interesting point there. Thank you to Leland Miller for wisdom from China Beige Book oh, on uh, so the, the path forward. And, you know, he said, you know, thumb up, but, and there was a, it was a nuanced <laughs> conversation. Uh, we're going to get out single best idea. It's going to be a really good, I think Chris Whalen's going to uh, be one of our two chosen on single best idea. This has been a spectacular week and to have it end with Damien Sassar has been very gratifying. Thank you to Thank all you. of you uh, for listening, particularly out on YouTube. It's our new distribution, YouTube. You search Bloomberg Podcasts, and the bonus is a live chat. Led Zeppelin, 1969. You know the echo in it? That was a mistake. The giant Eddie Kramer had to cover up some recording mistakes. Really? So he threw a lot of echo on. I thought that was Robert they, Plant speaking twice. They invented it right there. 
Have a great weekend.